Listen, I don't know what you're thinking right now. I don't know how you know me. Some of you may know me from 25 years ago, and I'm kind of stuck in time as a guy in an infomercial with you. <laughs> or you think that I'm Mr. Positive Thinking. I never was. Um, but I, my whole focus in life has been, how do you get people to make decisions that change their life? You and I both know business is all decisions. Your life is decisions. And I came by not to give you a speech, not to give you a pump up, but to make sure, how many of you came to Dreamforce because there's some things you want to take to the next level? Who's in that place? Say, I. <laughs> and in order to get ourselves to make decisions, many of you, how many have had decisions you needed to make for a very long time, and you kept promising yourself you make the decision, take action, but you just didn't do it? Who's done this before? Say, I as well. Awesome. Who's been in a relationship way too long? <laughs> Say, I. Why the hell did you stay? You knew it was wrong for them, it was wrong for you. So decision making is what frees us. And all the time I hear people say, you know what, it took me 10 years to change this part of my life. And when I talk to people, I say, really, if we look at your life, it wasn't 10 years, it was a moment. There's a moment when your life changes. There's a moment when your business changes. There's a moment when Mark was talking to me and he came to my third seminar, I'll never forget him, and he talks about Biggie as he, I am, he's standing in the front row, it's his third one in a row, he's hard to miss. And he comes up and he gets in my face, he goes, I want you to remember me. I've made a decision today. I'm working for this company called Oracle and I'm leaving. I'm gonna start this new company called Salesforce.com. You kicked me over the edge, third time through. And he said, we're gonna do a hundred million dollars a year and we're gonna change business around the world. Next year, they're gonna hit 10 billion, which he and I talked about in Fiji about four years ago. Decisions are what created this juggernaut that we see and that we all love, this community called Salesforce. And this environment is so unique. And I came by today to see if you might wanna make a couple of decisions. Who'd be up for something like that? Say, I. Now, whether we make a decision or not has a lot to do with not just our intelligence, because I love coming here. People ask me, you know, what is Dreamforce, this thing you're going to, again? And I say, it's kind of like Coachella for geeks and techs. And I said, but I've been here as a keynote three out of the last four years, so what does that say about me, right? What I love about this environment is it's wickedly smart. You've got some of the smartest people, and you've got people that are really, truly socially conscious. But how many of you are very smart and sometimes don't make smart decisions? Say, I. And so one of the things I'd like to do here is cover two things, two areas. We'll talk about business here, and we'll talk, cover some fundamentals here that I think if we put focus into them, they can guide better decisions, and they can make a difference in your career, whether you're in the company, if you're a small business, they can help you take yourself to the next level. Over these years, I've kind of grown a little bit from the guy that does motivational talks to now I have 31 companies that I've started or I'm a founder or initial investor in, and we do over $5 billion a year in sales in seven different categories. We've got 1,000 employees around the world. And it's just, uh, it's grown so much. And I've learned so much. And I've had the opportunity of going on this ride with Mark here for 17 years. So I've learned a few things in that area. So I'd like to share them with you. But the second area I'd like to talk about is your own personal life. How many of you got some areas in your own personal life that you'd like to massively take to another level, improve, transform? Say, I. Good. So I'm curious, why are you here? Ma'am, why did you come to Dreamforce? put you right on the spot. Can we give her a microphone? Give her a hand, please. She's got a microphone. Uh, my name is Darren. I came from Russia. I just moved to San Francisco. And there is my hide in San Francisco here. Wow. And why did you come here for Dreamforce, though? Uh, because uh, my husband runs Digital Genius Company, and I'm interning in this company right now and trying to emerge in all this community. You gotta work on your happiness, that's clear. We really need to help yeah. you out with that. Give her a big For hand, sure. thank you very much. How many of you came here because you know the world is changing faster than ever, and as corny as it sounds, it's only gonna accelerate? Say, I. How many understand that this is the way to get your edge, whether you're a small business, medium-sized business, you're a giant enterprise, and you come here to figure out the technology that you think is gonna lead you? I'm curious, how many here for those reasons? How many of you came here because you're in this speech today because you got a Tony Robbins guy? Maybe I can get some free stuff. Maybe you'll share something with me. Okay, good. I got that. I got who you guys are. How many of you came because you do in this room anyway for this session with me because you didn't want to change something in your life or improve it? How many came for that reason this morning? Okay. And how many of you came because you want to change, for example, earn more money? I'm curious. Okay. You could say, I go for it. A little energy. 
And how many of you came here because you want to change something like a relationship or increase your energy physically? I'm curious. Let me see your hands. How many of you have no idea why you're here? It was just on the docket, so you showed up. Let me see your hands. <laughs> so one of the things that if we're going to make a shift, this is a wickedly smart group, but you can be really smart, as we said, and not use your intelligence at the fullest level. You cannot maximize who you are. And so while I on, want to honor Mark, and I love this experience here, this experience has really got to also have a level of energy if you want to go to another level. That's not fake and artificial. I'm not a positive thinker. How I've changed business is by getting people to make decisions, and you do that when you're energy rich, not energy poor. And working with people over the years, I've had the chance coaching with Mark, obviously, all these years, but I've also had the chance to work with guys like Steve Wynn, if you know Las Vegas, basically revamped that entire city, one of the geniuses in the field, multi-billionaire. I've had the chance to work over that time with Peter Guber. Many of you know, he owns the LA Dodgers, 52 Academy Award nominations. He's also in a position where he owns the Warriors and has built that organization. You remember where it used to be and where it is today. And as I look at these people, I find what they have in common are two things. Number one above anything else, Richard Branson would be another one, hunger. Hunger, I believe, is even more important than intelligence. Intelligence is so important. But there are a lot of very intelligent people that never maximize their capability. How many know somebody very smart that can't fight their way out of a paper bag? Say aye. <laughs> so intelligence is so valuable, but hunger is even more. And if you've come to a program like this, I know the hunger is there. But the second thing it requires is a massive amount of energy. Because what I've found in life is many times people have the ability to do things. They know what to do. They just don't do it. And a big part of that is energy. So when I was back there feeling the energy, you got the music, it's so quiet in here. You're being quiet right now. Most of you are doing what you've done most of your life when you went to an education environment. And what is that? You're now learning the way you did when you went to a 20th century school. In a 20th century school, what do we learn? The bell rings and what are you supposed to do? Immediately report to your what? Position. And when you get to that position, you're supposed to sit down and start a conversation with the people around you. Is that right? You're supposed to initiate, is that right? No, when you went to 20th century school, you were taught, sit down, be quiet, be passive, wait till someone tells you what to do. Today, if you wait for someone to tell you to do, if you don't talk to your neighbor, you're out of business. Who's with me here? Say, I. So I'd like to change this, because how many of you in this room have ever gone to an environment where you learned something that you thought was really, truly valuable? No one sold you on it. You personally thought this is really something that could change my business, change my life. You were excited about it. But when you went home, you literally never applied a bit of what you've learned. Who's ever done this before? Raise your hand, say I. Oh, come on. If you're not raising high you'll hand, you lie about other shit too. Raise your hand, say I. Who's done this more than once in your life? Say I. Who still feels intelligent? Say I. So we're all smart people. Why would smart people learn something, get in an environment like this, and then not maximize it? It's because we've all been conditioned by our traditional education, which was designed back in the 19th century, 20th century, where you're designed to get a job, where you were supposed to report at a certain position, someone told you what to do, basically it was an assembly line. Today that's not true. So I like to break out of that because research shows if you sit and listen to me passively like you are right now, you're being very nice, smiling, nodding your head, being sweet, I appreciate it. But if you do that, research shows three months from now, you'll remember about 10% of what was said which basically was wasting your time and wasting mine too. I don't want to waste yours, much less mine. So if you listen and take notes, it jumps up to the 40, 50 percentile, even if you never look at the notes again. Because just writing it down drives the groove deeper. So I'd encourage you to do that. I don't see many of you with any form of notes, but I know you have your phones. Some of you do, but if you have no notes, you must not have had a very high expectation of much value coming out of this session, clearly. But thirdly, if you physically engage your body, which is what I like to do, your voice, your body, your energy, engagement is part of what we're going to talk about here in business. It's the most pathetic level in a long time worldwide. Even though we have all these tools for productivity, we have all these tools for distraction. And as a result, most people are not maximizing. So if we want to transform, the thing we really need to be able to shift is get ourselves engaged at a different level. So what I'd like to ask you to do is from here on out, if you're willing to, is let's start with some energy. Because let me ask you a question. If you have two people in a relationship, let's just go intimate for a moment. And you have two people and both these individuals are really, they're in a magnificent state of mind and emotion. Their life is going beautifully. They're happy as could possibly be. And they enter a relationship, two really happy people. What's that relationship going to be like? You tell me. If you know nothing else, what kind of relationship is going to be if you've got two people in a great peak state? Tell me, what's it going to be like? 
Now, if I'm having a soliloquy, you won't get anything out of this. Now, I'm asking you to not answer the question just so you refer, refer back to me or affirm. I'm doing it because if you sit passively, you won't remember anything. But if you activate your nervous system by raising your hand, by asking questions, by yelling out the answer, then the angel will rise. Who's willing to do this? If you are, raise your hand, say I. Awesome. So if you're gonna take it to the next level, maybe we should just do it right away because you guys are so in that nice, beautiful, deep trance. Are you really like this all the time? I doubt it, seriously. You're going in that school learning process and I don't wanna have you waste your time that way. So let's do something to start with. Stand up. Shake your body out just for a second. Been sitting, shake it out, shake it out, wake it up. And here's what I'd like you to do. High energy, two high energy people, what kind of relationship are they gonna have? If they're both feeling great, what's the relationship gonna be like? Come on, tell me. Are they going to deal with challenges in a great state? Yes or no? Yes. So our state is the most important thing that influences our capability, our results in life. Lots of people have capability, but activating it comes from energy. When you are energy rich, you have a different life. The higher the energy, the more things can get done. If there are problems in your high energy state, can you solve them quicker? Yes or no? Yes. And what if you got two people in a medium like okay states, not even about each other, so their life is kind of okay. What's the relationship like? Come on guys, what is it? Okay. It's okay. What do you got two people in a crappy state, in a lousy state, and they love each other? What's still gonna happen? Tell me quick. It's gonna be a lousy relationship. You're gonna have pain, you're gonna have problems. That's also true in business. The more energy you have, the more things can be organized quicker, faster, make it happen, you can solve problems. When you're energy poor, even smart people don't maximize. And the problem is in our culture today, because of technology, technology is starting to condition us instead of us just condition the technology. Today, we sit so passively. If you walk into most businesses today, everybody's in a deep trance. And you can see it, because there's very few rooms that I walked in that are as dead as this one was when we started here. And yet, I know you're not dead. You're the peak of performers in the world. But we're internal when I say that. And there's nothing wrong with being internal, but there are times we got to be externalized to make it work. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And so what I'd like to do is let's see if we can do something a little different. Because what we don't want to leave here with is have you come here, listen, hear those interesting thoughts and go on. We want to go home and make the shifts in our lives. Who's up for it? Say aye. aye. So to do that, we're going to do some unconventional things to get things moving in here so we have a different level of energy. So I'd like you to find somebody nearby right now, point at them and go, I own you. <laughs> no, say it like you mean it. I own you. <laughs> no, say it with more intensity. I own you. You. Now, when you say I own you, what you're really saying in that moment is, I am challenging you, you low energy person. <laughs> and what we're going to do is, where does energy come from, ladies and gentlemen? Someone tell me, where does energy come from? Food. Does energy come from food? <laughs> How many of you remember last Thanksgiving, where you were last Thanksgiving? Yes, and at Thanksgiving, what'd you do? You had plenty of food, and after you ate everything in sight and said, I'll never eat again, and someone said, pie, and you went, okay. <laughs> Who remembers? And at the end of that, what did you do? Go for a run? What'd you feel like after all that food? Tell me. You wanna lie down and go to sleep? There's no energy, there's no productivity, there's no joy, there's just sleep, right? So it's not food. Where does the energy come from? Come on. How many agree with me that if without energy, we are not going to maximize? If you agree, raise your hand and shout yes. yes. Thank you very much. So let's start to create that energy. So where is it coming from? It's not food. Yes. Sleep. How many have ever slept for eight hours and you're still freaking tired? Raise your hand. How many know people that look tired just to be around them? They make you feel tired. Say, ah. So it's not sleep. Who's ever had a night when you had no sleep whatsoever, you're totally exhausted, and then boom, something happened and you're awake for hours? Who knows what I'm talking about? Say, I. I would say to you where the energy comes from is psychology. It's a decision about who you're going to be and what you're going to tolerate or not in yourself. And those are the highest energy. If I said to you, Richard Branson, energy rich or energy poor? Quick. Okay, Mark Benioff, energy rich or energy poor? Yes. The room when I walked in here, energy rich, energy poor? poor. Good, so should we change that, yes or no? Yes. Good, then, let's, then when I say, point somebody and say, playfully, you turn them, I own you, what you're really doing is challenging them. And I wanna see if you can do something fun. I do this with the best athletes in the world, presidents, you name it, sounds crazy. But what we wanna do is we found that you can change your energy just by changing the way you move for a few moments, if you decide to. 
Energy equals emotion. Emotion is energy in motion. And so if you try to get yourself pumped up in your head, you go in circles. And we're not looking for a pump up, we're looking for fuel. Fuel that will move things. How many of you can tell me where you were the moment you heard the news about 9-11 way back when? How many remember where you were anywhere in the world? There's all kinds of countries here. Could you see it? Can you know exactly where? What if I said, where were you on 8-11? Nobody has a clue. Why? Information without emotion is barely retained. Information with emotion can get you to take action, get you move. The reason people traditionally don't act on what they've learned is they sit in a passive state like we've all been trained to do. That's why before I talk about anything, I want to shift this with you if you're willing to. Who's up for it? Awesome. Then be a little playful. We're going to do it again when I say, oh, you get really crazy. And then what we're going to do is you're going to outdo their energy for just 30 seconds. You're going to jump, celebrate like a little kid, like the most energy you have, trying to outdo their energy for 30 seconds. All right, look at somebody point and go, I own you. No, I own you. No, I own you. I can't. High energy place, are you gonna maximize or are you gonna under deliver, which one? <laughs> Is energy a habit? Yes. yes. I wanna make sure we maximize that habit. So maybe, since the energy's been lower, we should try something. Every one of you in this room is a person of influence. Some of you don't look at it that way, some of you do. Some of you, it's your identity, you're a leader. But how many consider yourself to be a leader of something? <laughs> Let me seize your hands. Awesome, what does a leader do? What makes you a leader? What's your job? No, not motivate. You got great people, you need to motivate them. I'm not here to motivate you. You don't need motivation. A leader gets results. And how do they do it? They maximize resources. And the greatest leaders in the world have always found a way to maximize better than anyone else. And in order to maximize resources, one of those steps is intelligence. One is that is hunger. See, Mark is about as hungry today as when I got to know him 17 years ago. We've known each other 27 years. But 17 years ago, we really started working together, personally. And if I look at Richard Branson, he's as hungry today as when he was 16 years old, working in a crypt, coming up with this idea called Virgin. Hunger is incredible. Energy is incredible. But we also have to ask the question, what makes people fail? Who here in this room has ever failed to achieve what you really want in life. A goal, a dream, a desire. Raise your hand, say I. I. Again, if you don't raise your hand, you lie about other shit too, don't you? Come on. <laughs> We've all failed. So when you failed, tell me why you failed. No one wants to talk about failure, do they? Everybody loves talking about success. But let's be honest. When you fail to achieve your goal, why? Or if it wasn't you, how many of had other people fail you? Let me see your hands, say I. So now we got all the victims, perfect. <laughs> So here's my question. When you failed to achieve your goal, why did you fail? Tell me. What's that? You quit too soon. Very nice, that's an honest answer. Give a hand, that's great. Give a hand for that, please, come on. Someone else, why'd you fail? Didn't take action, got distracted. Fear. Come on, what else? 
didn't have the right people. People said didn't have the right leader, sir. <laughs> right? Come on, what else? Didn't have the money, didn't have the capital. Didn't have the technology. Didn't have the contacts. What's that? Making excuses, which all this is. <laughs> Isn't it? By the way, I've done this. Who's done this? Who's made excuses like this to yourself? Let me shoot your hands. The first time I ever asked this question was when I spoke at TED way many, many moons ago. It was when it was really tiny here in Northern California. And they got up and told me, you have 18 minutes. And my shortest seminar, by the way, the reason I'm somewhat stressed, I want to add so much value to you today. And I got less than three hours. And I walk in the room and your energy's low. I'm like, I really want to serve you. I didn't come here to do a freaking speech. I don't do that. I came here because I love this man. I came here because this community is going to create 1.9 million jobs in the next four years. Pretty amazing. We're living in a time that's crazy, isn't it? Living in a time where we are in America, we're the economy everybody looks at. Our feeble economy is what people are looking at and wanting. That's how bad it is in the world. We're living in a time where people don't know what to think next, where the economy around the world has been inflated not with dollars or money. We don't even print it anymore. We couldn't afford to. We put ones and zeros in computers. We're living in a time for the first time in 5,000 years of banking where a banker now says to you in most parts of the world, here's what I'll do. Give me your money and I'll charge you and take your money. Negative interest rates. Uh, how do you explain that? Who's dumb enough to do that? Toyota is offering you bonds right now do you know what they're offering for their bonds? 0.001. It'll take you 69,000 years to double your money one time. That's the world we're in today. We're in a place of such uncertainty, and I'm here because there are tools that Mark and I have used over the years, and all the people I know, that change their lives and their businesses. I'm also here because this is a community that I know is socially conscious, because I know what the values are of this man, and they're mine as well. I'll give you an example. And when I look at how to create answers, I don't look for the excuses. I look for what can be done. And what I found is this. When I first did this at TED years ago, I asked this question because I walked in. One of the only times it was about as quiet as this room. And I asked people. And, you know, the room in those days was very small. It was the heads of Google, the guys from Yahoo. Uh, Steve Jobs was in the room. Pretty great group. In fact, it was the day that they came out with a technology that made this happen. They showed it for the first time from MIT. They pinched things and pictures grew. You can move things with your fingers. And we were so blown away. And Microsoft went in and bought the entire thing that was demonstrated. It was a tabletop with pictures. And Steve Jobs quietly walked back and went, I'm going to use that for a phone and change the world. Right? So here's what I said that day. I asked this question. I said, how many of you have ever failed? Not one hand went up. I said, I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. I said, how many you failed? And now everybody raised their hand. And I said, when you failed, why'd you fail? And I heard some of the same things I heard here. What were the things people said? Didn't have enough time. Didn't have enough capital. Didn't have the right technology. Didn't have the right contacts, right? Didn't have the right people. Didn't have all these things. And in the voice in the darkness, because it's a very dark room, I heard this voice say, didn't have enough Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and I looked out and it was Al Gore. <laughs> Vice President Al Gore there. And, and everybody started clapping, right, like crazy. And I looked at him and I said, that's one way to explain why you didn't become president of the United States. But I said, it's not an accurate one. I said, of course, easy for me to say, I never ran for president, but let's see if what well, you guys, if I'm true or not. When you told me all the reasons why you failed, you told me resources you were lacking. Courage is a resource, right? Time is a resource. Money is a resource. People are a resource. Technology is a resource. But here's the challenge. Resources are never the real problem. We all know it if we look around. Think about it. You can get the resources if you're resourceful enough. Resources are not the challenge. It's resourcefulness. So what is it we're really missing? It's some form of human emotion that we have learned to value less and less in a technologically driven society. See, if you're creative enough, can you get the answer, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. And creativity is a resource. If you're committed enough, can you get the capital, yes or no? Yes. If you care deeply enough for other people, will you get people to help you, yes or no? Yes. 
Are the answers there if you're resourceful enough, yes or no? And in fact, whenever you see people in business that fail, they'll always tell you they were missing resources when they really just weren't resourceful enough. This man is incredibly resourceful. I'm resourceful. Every person that I work with who's gone from nothing to a billionaire, and I've interviewed 50 of them just in the last four years to give you an idea, which is why I gave you that book. I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to give you a gift because I literally spent four years of my life interviewing these people. And they, none of the people I interviewed were from the Lucky Sperm Club. They all built it from scratch. They did it by doing one simple thing you got to do in business, which is finding a way to do more for others than who? Than you, yourself, but more than anyone else in the industry. You got to find a way to add more what? And when I did these interviews, one of the things that came across when I was doing this is these people just took no excuses. They knew they could get the resources if they were resourceful enough. So what are the ultimate resources? Creativity, joy, love, determination, flexibility. With those things, there's nothing we can't get. Who agrees with me on this? Say I. I. And then I turned back to Vice President Al Gore and I said, you know, so I heard you say you didn't have enough Supreme Court justices, but last night, I watched you give a speech, and he gave his inconvenient truth speech for the first time, and he was so passionate. Al Gore was passionate. It was an amazing thing. I'd never seen it before, and I said to him, I've never seen you that passionate ever before. I said, I watched the debate between you and George W. Bush, and I wanted to vote for you, but I couldn't. You just didn't have the energy. You kind of had an attitude. I said, you were not resourceful. I said, it never should have come down to justice as having to make that decision. It's because you are not resourceful enough. And there's this pause in the room, and all of a sudden everybody stood up in Democratic Northern California and started clapping like crazy. And Al stood up and came by and gave me a little high five, a little hug. And afterwards they said, get him run for president again. I said, no, no, no. But the point is, it's resources. And if you're resourceful enough, you can do it. So when I was writing this book, I decided to get a little resourceful on myself, and I thought, gosh, I, have, I grew up dirt poor, no money for food. And somebody fed my family when I was 11 years old. And they came to the door literally on Thanksgiving and knock on the door and here is this tall guy standing there with bags of food in a, in a pan on the floor on the ground with an uncooked turkey. And I'll never forget, he said, is your father home? And I said, just one moment. And I ran to get my dad thinking he'd be so excited. And unfortunately he was not. He was annoyed even though we didn't have any food. And the man said, sir, this is a gift from you. Someone knows you're having a tough time. They want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And my father said, we don't take charity. And he went to slam the door in the man's face. And the man kind of had his foot here and it bounced off his foot. And he's holding the bag still. And he said, sir, he said, this is not a handout. Everyone has tough times. This is a gift. And the person's doing it anonymously. They just want you to have a great Thanksgiving. And my dad said, we don't take charity. He started to slam the door again. This time he put his shoulder into it. And he hit and bounced off of him. He, and then he said something to my father. I thought my father was going to punch him. He said to my father, don't let your family, he point straight at me, don't let them suffer because of your ego. Ooh. I thought there was going to be a fight. My dad gave him a scowl, took the groceries, threw them on the table, slammed the door, never said thank you. And that day impacted me. It's why I'm here right now. Because that day I had to figure out a question in my mind, which is, how could my father be so angry about someone helping? And how come I was so happy? And the reason is right now as you're listening to me, in every moment of your life, you're making three decisions. You might want to jot them down and see if it's true right now. The first decision you're making is what are you going to focus on? Because whatever we focus on, we feel. And most of us let the world control our focus. You know, people say we're in the information age. We're not in the information age. The information age died a long time ago. We're drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom, aren't we? And so the bottom line is, you look around and I see my father, and what did he focus on? He focused on the fact that he had not provided food for his family. How would that make you feel if you knew you had failed at that level? You can get he was beating himself up. I focused on the fact there was food. What a concept. I was so excited. He focused on he had not provided it. The second question we ask every moment in our life is, what does this mean? Is this the end or the beginning? Is this person dissing you? Is this person attacking you? Is this person challenging you? Is this person loving you? Is this person coaching you? Whichever meaning you make is going to determine your emotion. Am I here to pump you up and motivate you? Am I here to serve you? Am I here to offer you some pieces you can make some decisions from that could be life-changing if you want them to? You get to decide. 
But whatever you decide is going to be your experience today and every day of your life. And most of us don't make these decisions consciously. We've got a conditioned response based on our past. So for most of us, the future is pretty much going to be like our past. We might make more money. We might do better in business. But we run into the same problems over and over again. How many can relate in some way inside here? Raise your hand if you can. Say, I. My dad said the question, what does this mean? I know what it meant to him because he said it out loud over and over again to all of us. I knew he focused didn't have the food. But he didn't provide it because he said, I failed my family. I am a failure. There's no food for my family. There couldn't be a bigger failure. And the bottom line is out of that experience, he made the third decision, what I'm going to do. And what he decided to do was leave our family shortly thereafter, which at the time was the most painful experience I thought of my life. But it turned out, you know, your worst experience of life can become your best if you decide to use it. And for me, I said, my God, there's food. But the big thing that changed my life was the meaning. And the meaning was strangers care. That's the meaning I pulled out of it. My father always said, no one gives a damn about anybody else. And I had plenty of evidence in the way we lived our life and the people around us. You know, there wasn't anybody coming to help before that ever. And we were always in a challenged place. When I started believing strangers care, it changed my whole life. One belief can change your life. Today, you can make one decision in the next little time we're together and literally change your life without hyperbole, without BS, without exaggeration, not positive thinking, because our beliefs create and our beliefs destroy our lives. And we have to become conscious as which ones are empowering us, we use them more, which ones are pulling. And most of us are going so fast, responding to our world, that we don't actually stop and really check in and feel what's really going on. So my third one is, what am I going to do? I decided someday I'm going to give back. I'm going to do this for other people because this changed my life. And so I have. I started when I was 17. I decided to feed two families. And it was, I didn't have any money, but I was like committed. I went to the grocery store and I got two baskets. And I thought I'm going to feed two families for like three days. I'm going to make this incredible Thanksgiving for them. I know what it meant to me. It's going to mean that to them. And I went to the store manager since I had much money. And I said, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to feed two families. Help me out. Give me a discount. And he gave me 10% off. And I thought, cheap bastard. <laughs> but I took the 10%. Right? And it was the best shopping spree I'd ever gone on in my life. And I'll never forget, I called a local church I was connected to, and I said, who do you know that needs help but won't ask for it? Because that was us. And they gave me the names of two families. And I'll never forget, I went to the first family, and it, it's, it shaped everything in my life. Because I borrowed an old van from a friend of mine. A little, I didn't know how to drive a stick shift, so that was a very interesting drive. And I went and took the groceries, and I pulled up to the first house, and I wrote a note. And I'd done it before I got there. And I said, this is just a gift from a friend. Have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And just know that you're deeply loved. Everyone has tough times. And if you can, someday do well enough to do this for one other family and pay it forward. And I put love a friend. I didn't say who I was. And I had someone else write it in Spanish in the back just in case they didn't speak English, which was really helpful because when I got there, they didn't speak English. And this woman about this tall <laughs> opens the door and she sees me holding these two things. I wore T-shirts and jeans because I wasn't going to be the giver, because I remember that insulted my dad. So I just made sure that it was just like, I'm the delivery boy. And this woman screamed, and she grabbed my neck, and she pulled me down and started kissing the side of my face. And I was like, no, no, delivery man, delivery man. She goes, no, 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 no. And she, I couldn't understand. And then she finally says, gift, gift God, gift God. Gift from God. And so I started getting a little teared. I was like, no, delivery guy. And, and so I kind of motioned where I put these groceries, and I'll never forget. She motioned me in, and as she did, she had four children, and one hit one leg, one hit the other. <laughs> they were starving for love and attention, and they were really starving for food, too. And when they saw this, they were so excited, and it just lifted my soul. And so much so that then they followed me back out to get to the truck, to the van, and I got some more bags. When they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> and the moment that has seared into my memory of my life, that changed my life, was... Seeing at the end, I, I didn't want to leave, but I had to. I go to the other food. And then one little boy just would not let go of my leg looking up to me. And it was just one of those surreal moments in your life because I was that boy one day, not that long ago. And so I walked in there and I tried to give him a hug and finally tried to excuse myself. And I don't speak any Spanish. I felt embarrassed. I should have. But uh, I turned to the woman and she's crying like this and smiling and crying. Quite a mixture of emotion. I'm feeling myself trying not to cry. And then, you know, all of a sudden I try to say, happy Thanksgiving. And I didn't know, so I said, Feliz Navidad. <laughs> I knew those two words, right? 
And I got in the van, I'll never forget, I put the thing in reverse, backed up, I looked up in the rearview mirror, and I saw her face with the four kids there, and uh, I left out one little detail that I found out. Her husband had left her a week before with kids with no money and no food. I had no clue. You want to talk about guidance, God, fate, whatever you want to call it, but it was there. Grace is what I would call it. And I remember I just started bawling uncontrollably. And I thought, why am I crying? It's such a beautiful moment. And I realized in that moment, the worst day of my life was the best day of my life. Because what I have ever been there if my father had been the man I wanted him to be in my life. If he had stayed, if he had done the things that I would want him to do, I wouldn't have the drive. And so I fed two families that time, that Thanksgiving. And then I went from there to four and then to eight. And then I got a little small company I started and they all got involved. And then I got to 100,000 people. And then I got to a million, then two million in about, I don't know, about 12 years ago. I fed two million people through my foundation and then I matched it. And I've been matching every year since then. Four million people a year to be fed, to give you an idea. And then when I read this, when I was writing this book, I got really resourced. I thought, these guys are multi-billionaires. I'm moving in that direction, which is an incredible privilege. And I'm doing this good work, but I got to step up my game because while we're watching these guys make billions, we're also in a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. And it isn't right. And we all have something we can do about it. And people like you are the ones that will do that. If we succeed, we have more we can give. If that becomes our our ethic, our way of being. And so the bottom line is I thought, you know what? How many people have I fed in my lifetime? And at that point, I'd fed 42 million people in the course of my life. And I thought, what if I did that in one year? And I got resourceful. And I found out how to do 50 million people. And then I got more inspired and I fed 100 million people last year. So the real reason I'm here is the other reason is I'd like to call to you to do so well that you can do well for others. And if you won't give a dime out of a dollar, I can promise you won't give a 100 million out of a billion. This guy did it when he had nothing. I've done it when I had nothing. That's why I'm doing it now, doing well, that's really wonderful. And I was here in San Francisco and I just happened to see somebody here. I was reading the newspaper and I was here earlier this year. I was doing some business and I saw that a group of nuns, a group of sisters from Notre Dame were getting kicked out. They're feeding the homeless and they're about to become homeless. In one of the richest communities in the world here, San Francisco, the tech community, and I couldn't believe that no one was doing anything. So I went and met these sisters and said, let me negotiate with your landlord. I don't think he wants to be hated by all humans. <laughs> and I met Kevin Fagan over here from San Francisco Chronicle and I asked him, how do I get these nuns? He introduced me to them and I sat down with them and I went and negotiated with this man. Everything's negotiable. And there was great leverage. Do you want to die? Do you want everybody to hate you? And so I worked it out. So my intention was work it out, give him $50,000 so he wouldn't raise the rent keep him in, and then I promised them I'd get him out within the year and help them find a new place. But I got so inspired, the nuns started looking for a place, and I was going to help them lease it. But they started looking to buy a place. It's like, how are you going to buy a place? You have no money. They said, well, you're praying to God that someone will show up and buy it for us. I'm thinking, shit. <laughs> so I bought them a place. They have their own place. So I thought, shit, I don't even live in San Francisco. What am I doing doing it here? But if you're resourceful, you do what's right wherever you are. And then we got them a place and then the people were fighting us on the soup kitchen. And then, so I needed a new place for them to be. So Mark's never acknowledged it, but I have to acknowledge. I called my buddy, I said, Mark, I bought the soup kitchen. How about you buy my condominium? And Mark did, he bought the place that they all live. Have a hand for Mark Benioff over here. Pretty amazing here, right? <laughs> so before I go any further, if you find real value by the time I'm done here, and I believe you will, significant value since you came here and paid something, I'm sure, I'd like to invite you to match me in helping either these local sisters or Feeding America. And I will match whatever you give, $10, $10,000, up to $5 I'll personally match. This room is filled with some players. If you're at that level, I'll do it. If you want to get resourceful and give in 10 bucks, or resourceful and give 10000 or resourceful and give $5 million, I'll match you. Or if you just want to help these nuns out, I want to point it out. I bring this up really simply because whether it's becoming president of the United States or feeding your family or feeding the world or changing your business, it comes down to resourcefulness. They asked Sam Walton in the 1974 had 78 stores. And if you read the Wall Street Journal, 
And if you read a bunch of the reviews done by the financial community, they all said in that year, sell. Does anybody know why they said sell? Sell Walmart in 1974. 78 stores. Why were they going to sell them? Because they said he's out of what? The R word. What is it? What? Resources. He has no more resources. He has no more cash. He has no more capability. And plus, who else is going to want to buy this cheap shit except this crappy little parts of the South? No one's going to want this anywhere else. And at that time, who are the biggest retailers in the world? Remember? Sears and Kmart. What happened to Kmart? <laughs> Bankrupt. Look at the number of stores. 1,300, 851. The combined market value of Sears and Kmart was 65 times Walmart. Where is Walmart today, ladies and gentlemen? How many stores? Throw it up there. It's the dominant player on the face of the earth. Today, you got 11,000 stores and a half a trillion in sales. A thousand dollar investment back then, if you didn't listen to these people and you never put another dime in, it would be worth $25 million today. Because people underestimated his resourcefulness. Business is resourcefulness. Your career is resourcefulness. You want to move up? Get resourceful. And the only way you're going to do that, number one, it isn't enough to be intelligent. I know you're smart as hell. But sometimes being so smart puts an ego on us and makes us not maximize our resources. Who's with me on this? Raise your hand. Say, I. I. And I'm here one to say, listen, if you lose your hunger, if you're willing to settle for less than you can be or do or create or share, then you're selling yourself short and you're going to make your life have not the juice it deserves. Who's with me here? Say, I. I. So if we want to know what it takes to succeed, you already have it. Every one of you is resourceful. But if we want to take it to another level, What's the level we want to get resourceful at? Let's talk business first, then your personal life, okay? Is that fair? Are you still with me? Great. By the way, if you think about this, if you want to know what it takes to succeed in business, if you own your own business, how many are small business here where there's an owner in the room? Raise your hand if you're an owner of a business. Awesome. How many have kind of a medium-sized business here? How many are enterprise size? Let me see a shot of enterprise size businesses. How many have no idea what size your business is or you're too tired to raise your freaking hand? <laughs> Thank you very much. So whatever your business size or capacity is, if we want to know what it takes to grow a business, all you got to look is the most successful businesses, or you could go back to Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker said it 30 years ago. He said, all business is is two functions, innovation and marketing. Innovation and marketing employs everyone else. You can't have accounting without a company that isn't constantly innovating and marketing. So let's write down what those are, because it's also true in your career. If you want to move up within a company or grow your company, you've got to innovate and market. What is innovation? It means finding a way to do more for others than whom? Anyone else. If you become the dominant force that will do more for others than anyone else, it's probably you begin to realize business is a spiritual game. Because what does every religion in the world talk about? Every great philosophy of meditation talk about? Treat thy neighbor like thy, love thy neighbor like thy, and yet how many people really do it? If you're innovating, you're looking for new ways to make life better. And the way to do that, if you want to jot down one thought that'll change the game, that most in high intention quality business owners fail to do at small businesses, a medium, and certainly an enterprise, is they forget. They start falling in love with their products and services. That is death in the world of constant change. You have to fall in love with your clients. This guy over here, and I'm, I'm blowing smoke and you know, it may sound like to you, but I love Mark. I love him dearly. I've known him all these years. And you must have great respect for him or you wouldn't be in this room. We've all benefited from what he's created, that vision made from decisions. But this man is nothing but innovation. It is, in my opinion, Forbes. How do you win most innovative company five years in a row for a half decade straight? You do it because he's not falling in love with his products. He's always willing to change the product. He doesn't give a damn the product. He cares about you. He's thinking constantly about how can I make life better for you. He just got traveling before he got here to eight different cities. He works around the clock. He's so excited he's going to do another eight cities right afterwards because he wants to know, what do you want? This entire company that dominates its industry is driven by that concept of innovation. You don't fall in love. And don't fall in love with your job. Fall in love with somebody you want to serve within that company, those clients. Because if you do that, you'll move up within the company as well. If there's no limit to what you can do, if you add more what? Add more what? Come on, guys, add more what? I know you're starting to drip down into that state. Nothing wrong with it, but let's get in our bodies. Because I know you intellectually, but most of us know the truth intellectually, but we don't do it. People know what to do. They don't do what they know. Because you've got to get it where it's activated. So innovation, that's what innovation is about. But if you innovate like crazy, that's not enough. You've still got to be an effective marketer. 
fact, who's ever seen someone who has an inferior product or service to your own and they've had bigger revenue sales impact? Raise your hand. How many have seen this? How many have been annoyed by this? Say, I. And why? Because they either innovated more and you were wrong, they were a better product, but very often they were a better marketer. Does the best product or service always win? Yes or no? No. The best marketed product will work at first, but if it's going to be sustained, it has to be the best product and the best marketing. Companies like Apple, companies like Google, companies like the company you're in right now, Salesforce, these are the companies that do both innovation and marketing. And if you're an employee of someone and you're saying, what's my ticket to make my life the way I want it? It's innovation and marketing within you. It's finding out what can I do to add more value to this company? What can I do to add more value to our clients? What can I do to make that happen? And then how do I make people know? How do I get people want to do business with me, want me to move up in the organization? That's what it really comes down to. Now, here's a question. Marketing today. Is marketing today easier or harder? Give me your first gut reaction nice and loud. Which one? Harder. Say it again. Easier or harder? harder? I'm hearing a lot harder. Raise your hand if you think it's harder. Raise your hand if you think it's easier. Okay, well, the room is about 60-40. It sounded worse than that because harder people talk harder. It's harder. <laughs> Both of you are right. It's easier and it's harder. It's easier because there's more ways to market and there's cheaper ways to market. There's social media. There's un these incredible opportunities. It's harder because there's so much more competition. It's hard to get people's attention today, isn't it? Right? Everyone is trying to get attention. Where is advertising today? Tell me, where is it? Everywhere. It's on, it's on bananas. It's on people's t-shirts. It's on their ass. It's, it, it's crazy. In fact, right now, a lot of retailers that deal with millennials are in deep trouble right now because they don't want to wear a label of somebody's brand anymore. It's a whole different culture. And you're seeing these companies that are going right now, massive drop in profits trying to figure out what the hell do we do? Why? Because they didn't innovate enough. They didn't market enough to find out what does this person really want and need. They fell in love with their product. They fell in love with their service. They didn't fall in love with their client and understand what do they want, what do they need, what do they fear. And by the way, that's true whether you're the business or whether you work in a business. That's number one job for all of us. That's what makes the economy go. Who's with me here? Say, I. You know how many, 15 years ago, research showed that the average person, if they were exposed to advertising, would see an average of four exposures before they took action. That was the average. Some people do it the first time, some people do it nine times, but the average is four. Does anybody know what the average is today? Oh, they just put it up there. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. <laughs> 16. So those that said harder, you're right. It's harder because it takes so much more. But that also is precluding that your message isn't very engaging. If it's engaging enough, you can get them in the first time. Now, how do you do that today? Well, if you're a small business, you go, how do I compete? We've seen all these companies disappear, right? There used to be these small bookstores, and then who came along? Barnes and noble and they thought they owned everything and then who came along amazon and guess what that's the game who did you use to search with years ago before google what company i can't even hear you <laughs> right yahoo right but no one searches yahoo now right they got displaced that displacement came from innovation and marketing raise your hand if you follow here say i so if you and I are going to break through it, if you're a small business, I'm sure you're freaked out about it. If you're a business business, you think, I'm just going to spend more money. Today, spending more money isn't enough. Today, people want something that's authentic and real. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And without that, you really can't even get their attention. The old ways don't work. How many of you don't even see banner ads anymore? They're like invisible to you when you're on the web. Raise your hand. Say, I, if that's true. Do me a favor. Raise your hand if you literally don't see the banner ads. Raise your hand. I want you to look around the room and look at the percentage that don't even see it. So, lesson one, no banner ads! <laughs> what you have to do today is find a way to add more value even in your marketing. Where your marketing is providing value, where you're providing information, insights, where you become a trusted resource. This organization is a great marketing organization and the way they market is they don't just send you a bunch of stuff and say buy it. They put on conventions like this and say let's bring the very best that exists, let's bring whoever we can, let's do whatever we can to make sure these customers' lives are better. And that's why you have an allegiance. The technology works but it's more than that. Remember back in 1997 when a little company called Apple was not the most profitable company in the world when they were on the verge of bankruptcy and they seemed to have no resources? 
but they had one thing still. They had groups of people, I was one of them, that like, my whole companies, they all went to Microsoft, and I was like, I'm keeping my Apple, and my creative team is gonna have Apple. And we stuck, even though there was no software, it was terrible, but they created something different. Watch this, no disrespect, just you give me the real feeling. I'm gonna say a company name, you make a sound you associate to that company. Make the sound, don't hesitate, from the gut. Microsoft. Microsoft. Apple. Apple. That's the difference. There's billions and billions of dollar difference in those little emotional differences that you can hear in a voice. Think about the difference in what's there. So having the ability to create a raving fan client, not a satisfied customer. Satisfied customers go away, raving fans stay. And so the component that I want you to look at though is what will really create that? Now, big companies will try and do still major advertising. In fact, I got a phone call a couple years ago, right before the Super Bowl, and it was a group from Nike, and they said, we want to do a commercial, and we'd like you to star in this commercial. And I said, listen, I'm the wrong guy. I love your product. And I said, for years I did freaking infomercials. I didn't want to do infomercials. Just no way to get my message out. So then, I, you know, you're between spray on hair and fake diamonds and stuff. And I said, I hated it, but it, it got me the President of the United States as a client. It got me Serena Williams as a client. It got me Hugh Jackman as a client. It got me Steve Wynn as a client because people got exposed to my actual products that they bought and it made a difference in their life. So I said, you know, I don't really want this, but I'm doing this and I sure as heck don't want to do a commercial. And I said, I love, you know, great, great shoes, great everything. They go, no, this is really special. They said, Kobe Bryant has created a new shoe. It's the most incredible shoe. And I'm thinking, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> Right? What's the difference between Nike and Adidas? Marketing. Isn't it true? What is really the difference in those shoes? Nothing. You just have to learn to brand, just do it, or you learn to brand. I don't even know Adidas. That ought to show you why Nike's doing better, right, for some people, right? It's no difference. But they said, listen, hear us out. We're going to do a commercial. You're going to love this. Because the commercial is going to be where Kobe's going to pretend to be you. And then he's going to be coaching the most successful people in the world. And he said, you'll be one of them, you'll be sitting there, but you'll also, we're gonna also have, you know, uh, we'll have Serena Williams there, and we're gonna have Kanye West, and we're gonna have Richard Branson. I said, Richard's one of my friends. I said, Serena's one of my friends and clients. I know Kanye. If I call them now, they're gonna tell me you're gonna be in the commercial. And they said, if you are, they will. <laughs> so I called Richard, we're supposed to have a meeting like two weeks there in London, I said, are you really going to come film this? He goes, if you are, I go, great, we have the meeting in LA, I'm in for it, right? So we do this little commercial. <laughs> what the hell is that? And that made them sell a lot of shoes in their mind because all they understood is something that makes no sense. Did anybody see anything about shoes that made any sense in this? <laughs> no, because the marketing was, can you imagine how much it cost to put all those people in a room and do this little endorsement? That was a huge sum of money. Those are some of the biggest players on earth. And they got the return because people don't buy products. They buy emotions. They buy identities. If you buy a Volkswagen, you're buying a different identity than if you're buying a Ferrari. And people buy Volkswagens think people buy Ferraris are absolutely stupid. And people buy Ferraris think people buy Volkswagen go, what's wrong with them? Because we all identify things and branding is that identity. So today though, you can do this with almost no money. You're a small business or even a big business. It's now, it's about using your brain to brand differently. There's a, some of you remember the Chilean miners? Do you remember the Chilean miners that were stuck underground for, what, 70 days, whatever it was? How many remember that, that story? You should, because it was all over the world. And when they were about to get out, somebody really smart figured something out. We don't want to spend that kind of money. We can get a bigger impact than that right away if we're just a little bit creative, if we're a little resourceful, remember? And so a little company called Oakley said, what's going to happen when those people come out and they've been underground for two and a half months? They're going to be blinded by the light. So they flew one of their guys with 32 pairs of glasses, which cost them about $2,000, and that's probably whatever, not even $2,000. And they got a half a billion dollars of advertising. That picture was on every major newspaper, every TV pieces around the world. That's the difference between being resourceful as a marketer or just going and spend a ton of money and hoping you can still be part of that old order. How many follow? Say I. I. Now you might say, but Tony, we, our company, we sell data or we sell something else. We don't sell something emotional. People don't buy for emotion. You're wrong. They still buy an identity. Right? Not bad. 
you know, Harry Potter, they're opening a brand new Harry Potter that they're going to do down at Universal Studios. And people are waiting for years. And of course, Universal had a budget. I apologize, I don't remember the number, but it was a gigantic marketing budget. But fortunately, the person running marketing was much more resourceful. So you know what she did? She decided she was going to spend not $1 on advertising, not a penny. She wasn't going to make even a commercial to go on the web. She called the 12 largest bloggers in the world who are experts and followed on Harry Potter. She said at midnight, send them a special invitation. There's only 12 of you. You're, if you're late by one second, you're off the call. We're going to give you a special insight to what's coming. She spent an hour on the phone telling them the story of what was going to happen. And within 24 hours, more than 250 million people around the world knew everything about what that park was and didn't spend a penny because she was resourceful. Don't tell me you don't have the resources. If you don't, it's because you're low energy. It's because you're so freaking smart, you're in your own way. You're yet in your brain being smart. You're staying in your head. I tell people, stay in your head, you're dead. It's the heart where you'll find the breakthrough. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And that's also true whether you're a company or whether you're an individual in the company wants to move up. Because I know some of you is like, well, that's great for the company. What about me? This is really about you in the end. How you can be more resourceful to innovate, bring more value. If you brought that to Universal, do you think that woman's going to move up in that company? <laughs> you think people in that company are going to want her to be a top executive? There is no limit. The only limit to our impact is our creativity and caring. If you care enough and you're creative enough, there is no limit. But most of us allow our mind to get in the way and we get caught up. Or we just do what we've been doing and we do it a little bit better. But that's not going to make you feel alive. It's not going to feel joy in your life. Now, here's a question. Is it possible that the breakthrough you're looking for, by the way, how many came here looking for breakthroughs for your business or within your career? Raise your hand if that's one of the main reasons you came here besides to party, because you kept me all up out last night. I know you're out partying like crazy. How many came here for some breakthroughs? Raise your hand and say, aye. aye. Great. Breakthroughs are sometimes counterintuitive. Sometimes it's the littlest thing they'll do it. I want to get you to think about this in this business because you could make breakthroughs that no one thought of because they're looking for the big thing. If you're a tech person, if you're a salesperson, we all think a certain way based on the way we've been conditioned and trained. But if you think outside the nine dots, if you do what everybody else does, you do a little bit better, you have a little advantage. But if you do what no one else does, you have a gigantic advantage. So I'll give you an example. What did Steve Jobs do in 1997 when Apple was almost bankrupt and he had no real money? One thing is he made a deal with Microsoft, which was like the evil empire to Apple. But what did he do? What, was, what did he do to come up with a product? He didn't have time. He came up with a product that most people would say, well, there's no innovation. In fact, his engineers, the people inside, they're all saying, this is a piece of crap you want to build. He said, trust me, we're going to do this. I don't think he said, trust me. He was a little more intense than that. Right? He said, this is what we're going to do. Don't question me, I think is what he actually said. You probably know what he said. You were good buddies back then. And so what happened? He, I know what had happened because one of my dear friends said to me one day, we're talking about computers for some reason, I don't know why, but he says, my grandmother wants a computer for the first time. And I said, what kind? He said, that's what I asked her. And she said, a pink one. You remember what happened with the old iMac? Do you guys remember that breakthrough? That's what kept the company alive. And all it was was what color were computers before that? What color were they? Throw up beige, weren't they? Right? And all of a sudden, all he did was come out and bring color. That was massive innovation. Now, how much creativity, how much money did that shit cost? That's what we're talking about when I talk about being innovative. You want to think outside of it. I'll ask you a question. Where were you in 1999? Where were you living? What were you doing for a living? Were you partying like it was 1999? Who remembers where you were in 1999? Okay, now that you're there, stay there for a moment, 1999, and answer this question for me. If in 1999, what was the dominant computer company in the world? Who was it? Quick. Microsoft controlled, what, 98% of all computers through their software. 98%, that's a fairly large market share, right? Now, at that time, Bill Gates had a really beautiful vision. Brilliant vision. He wanted to get rid of all those Britannic encyclopedias, and he wanted to create this online resource that would allow you to be able to know all the knowledge of humanity for everyone, anytime. And he had a budget that was virtually unlimited, and some of the smartest people literally in the world that worked at Microsoft. Is it true, yes or no? Smartest people, unlimited money. That's called unlimited resources. 
Now, his competition was a group of people working as volunteers. All volunteers, no money, no background, no experience, no infrastructure, and supposedly not as smart, because they certainly weren't paid that kind of money to be smart. If I asked you in 1999, who would you bet on? Be honest, if you had to put a sum, a large sum of money, Microsoft with all the resources, or a little group of volunteers called Wikipedia, who would you have bet on? Tell the truth, nice and loud, go. That's right, and you would have lost heavily. And the reason I tell you that is really simple. When we talk about innovation, when we talk about breakthroughs, sometimes the littlest thing is the biggest thing. The littlest thing. By the way, being first is not enough any, anymore either. You can be first and then Apple comes along and takes it from you afterwards, right? Being first is not it. There was a company called Vimeo that was first in the marketplace doing what now most of you think YouTube does. In fact, if you looked at it back then, we saw Vimeo and you saw YouTube, two year difference between them. I know Chad who created YouTube, brilliant guy, and what he did was really good, what I teach, he modeled them. He saw what they did and he modeled them. If you looked at them visually back then, they looked very, very similar. They did the exact same thing. But one was sold for $1.65 billion a couple of years later. And the big, big difference, what was the difference? Look at them. Visually look pretty much the same. Someone tell me, what was the $1.65 billion difference? No, they uploaded the same way. Speed, they had the same speed. In fact, Vimeo was a little bit faster. They had a little bit more efficiency in the beginning. Somebody just said it. You must know the story, sir. There were, look it up, put it up on the screen there. There was one share button versus nine share buttons on YouTube. Somebody said, the more you ask, ask and you shall what? Receive. If we ask enough times, they'll share. But when people share, you get that geometric multiplied effect that we all understand now. That difference is the difference between two large companies, one of which is kind of nice but is dwarfed by YouTube and the other which went on to become the basis of where most people put their time and their energy for a lot of people for creation. So I want you to get that if you and I are gonna to go to a different level, all you gotta understand is it isn't beyond your reach. It's beyond your reach if you're low energy, it's beyond your reach if you're unresourceful, it's beyond your reach if your ego tells you you're so smart. We need to put our smarts aside and use them with enough emotion and connection to say, how can I add more value? That's where the game really changes. Who's with me on this? Say I. Now, so that comes down to then, how do we really make sure that we succeed? Then how do we get this resourcefulness in our companies? How do we do it within ourselves? Let's start with the companies. The most challenging thing in the world today is a term. You know, in business, we always have these terms, they come buzzwords, we hear them so much. But the reason they start out is because they're usually true. And that buzzword is engagement, right? I know Mark is obsessed with engagement. I'm obsessed with engagement. When I walked up here, I'm running up here, they wanted me to run from back there, it's hot as hell, and I'm looking around and nobody's engaged. What the hell? And so I know I can't serve you if we don't become engaged together. I'll, I can't do that if I just hear and talk to you or talk at you. So that's why I asked you and I really thank you for participating and I want to keep that energy going because we've gone long enough that you've begun to go back into your learning trance. And you're being very kind and participating, I'm really grateful for it. But the higher the energy, the more you retain. Who's with me here? Say, I. Let's talk about engagement. What the hell's engagement? Engagement is where everything grows. What's our job in business? Our job is to add more what? Win, once in a while or every time. If you do it for decades, you become a brand. If you become a brand, people will bend down on one knee, reach behind other things to buy Coca-Cola even though very often when you do studies, and they've done in the past, some of their competing brands seem to have a better taste test result. People don't give a shit, give me the Coke. Because <laughs> it gives them certainty, because it becomes part of their identity, right? So our job is to engage people. And if we look at engagement, involvement, passion, connection, massive focus on how to do more for the client than anybody else, what, how are we doing that? How are we doing? Well, most of us pat ourselves on the back, but throw up the statistics. This is scary and crazy, and it shows you why economies around the world are where they are right now. According to the Gallup poll, which was done in 142 countries, intensive, 13% of employees worldwide are truly engaged at work, meaning they're passionately connected to the sense of mission, the value, and when they're at work, they're trying to maximize their time for the benefit of that mission. That means, by the way, 87% are not engaged. 
Now, it's better in the United States. We're better than anywhere else in the world. We have the highest engagement, a whole 29%. Think about that. That means 71% of U.S. workers are disengaged. That's pretty crazy. Does that make you crazy? And I know it's true. You know, I went and did, when I went on this last book tour, I did 110 interviews. It's crazy, the most I'd ever done. And so I was going all around, and I won't mention the companies, but I was going to all the media companies, and I walked into these buildings. I got 31 companies. I, I have very passionate values about how we play the game of life, right? And I walked through these buildings, and the world, because we're so technology-driven, it's so dead, but I'm walking around watching people on their personal Facebook, tweeting, doing all stuff, and the energy is so low because there's no mission. And you look around and go, how do these companies survive? And if you look at our economy, our productivity has dropped. Everything else dropped because now we're so distracted because we have so few companies that have that mission connection today. And the ones that do, they dominate, completely dominate in that process. Now, what should really concern you is the next statistic. 24% are actively disengaged. What does that mean? It means they have no passion for their work, they lack any motivation to get the job done, they're unhappy, and they're likely to attack the company. If you're trying to grow your business, and one quarter of them are trying to screw you over that work for you, that are your partners, how many know people like this in your own business? Come on, raise your hand if you know them. Nice and high, raise your hand if you look around the room. Clearly, Donald Trump has at least one of those that sent his taxes to the New York Times. <laughs> right? Somebody was actively disengaged at the Trump Organization, sent his tax returns, and kind of gave him a whole other challenge for him to deal with once again, in case he didn't have enough before this. That's how bad it is. Now, here's what's great. The companies that do have engagement have an unbelievable competitive advantage. You name, what are some of the companies that have the most engaged employees? Instead of me telling you, you tell me, tell me. And they're already putting it out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your timing is wonderful. We put Salesforce. Do they have you engaged? Yes or no? What other company gets a convention of 100,000 people to come and spend time for days, throws the best parties with you two, gives you the best technology, and you want to come back? How many have come back here more than once to this Dreamforce? Let me see a show of hands. That's called engagement. But the employees at Salesforce engaged. Because Mark started out with a vision from the very beginning. We're both into contribution. In the very beginning, he said, tell him we'll do this one, one, one plan that now Google uses, right? 1% of our stock, 1% of our profits, 1% of our time. I'm sure he'll go over the newest statistics in his, well, his talk tomorrow, so I won't say a word and steal that from his company, his ideas, but I'm impressed, and I'm sure you will be too. Google, Starbucks, Zappos, you name it. Tony Robbins, somebody, but that's not, that's not, a, that's, oh, that's the slide of Tony Robbins. Okay, I'll get that. <laughs> They're trying to put us with Salesforce. We're not in that, that realm. Not yet, anyway. So the point is, what these companies have is an advantage. Here are the statistics that the study showed. Throw them up there real quick for us, if you would. One of the things you see immediately when you look at these companies are 20% higher profitability on average, 10% higher customer ratings, 28% less theft, 48% fewer safety incidents. I'll tell you what else they found. Nearly two times greater satisfaction at work, 1.7 to be exact. And they're three times more likely to stay. How important is that to a company's sustainability? Right, today, the average cost, if you lose a sales executive, it costs you a million dollars in business, it'll take 12 months before you were back to the same level to replace that person. All because you didn't fully engage. So how do we get people to engage? We get them to engage, because think about this, how can you get us to engage if you're not fully engaged? And how many of us have been guilty of getting overwhelmed, stressed, frustrated, whatever, and not being fully engaged. Who's been there before? Even in this room of engaged people, raise your hand and say, I. So if we, the hungry, driven ones, can let this happen to ourselves, you can know what's happening with everybody else that's not as driven as you are in this area. So it is a challenge, to say the least. How do we solve that challenge? Well, you can't move someone if you're not moved. You can't touch someone if you're not touched. And that's why what we're here to do today, I want to talk about in a few moments, may be the most important thing of all. And that is making sure that you are fully engaged in a way that produces the maximum results that you want. So rather than me tell you, if I tell you to be me telling you, here's what I want you to do. Stand up just for a second real fast. Stand up. Shake your body out. Shake it out just for a second. Shake it out. Shake it out. And put yourself in a group of three people as fast as you can. If you've got a notebook with you, you're welcome to do it. But go grab three people real fast. And one of you grab a notebook or a phone or an iPad or something 
And what I'd like to do, all three of you, raise your right index finger towards the ceiling in your group. All three of you. Okay? Point to the leader of your group now. <laughs> Whoever's got the most fingers, you're it. If you all pointed at yourselves, we know a little bit about your group. <laughs> okay? So here's what, leader, here's what you do. I want you, in fact, just sit down first for just a moment. Now you know who your group is. In a moment, you're going to jump back up with your group. I want you to write down the answer to a question. Throw up on the screen for me the questions real quick. I want you to write down an honest answer as to how engaged are you to your maximum capability? How would you rate your level of engagement with the people you lead and manage on a scale from 1 to 10? 10 is absolutely off the charts, mind-boggling. They blow your mind. One is, that I got a dead group of people, right? And what do you need to improve? What do you need to improve to increase that engagement? Instead of me telling you, you tell me. You tell each other. And the third question is, what specifically do you need to do to engage your people at a different level? What could you do? Because we're going to share this because then you get some ideas from the other two people as well. And finally, what do you do, what, what do, you do a less than adequate job engaging what could you do better with that person? In other words, think of someone you're not good at engaging. If you're good at engaging everybody, how many have a problem child? Someone who does not maximize their resources within your team. Raise your hand if you got somebody like that. Good. Then I want you to write down that person and ask yourself, instead of they're screwed up, what could I do? Where, where am I not engaging? How could I engage them more? So five quick questions, and then I'm going to put you with your team. Body out, shake it out, wake it up. Give me your score. How many of you were a perfect 10 in your engagement as a leader? Raise your hand. Okay. One liar. Good. Very nice. How many were a 9? Raise your hand if you gave yourself a 9. Who was an 8? Okay, now I want you to look. 90% of this room, maybe 95, is below an 8 on a 0 to 10 scale. By your judgment, not mine. I'm not so judgmental of you as you are. And if you're below an 8, how could you possibly maximize your resources? Much less enjoy yourself because, listen, when you don't give your all, I remember I, I, I got a chance to interview Coach John Wooden. Anybody remember who John Wooden is? Greatest basketball coach in history of the world, college basketball. Won 11 national championships, 88 games in a row. And it wasn't like the Bulls with Michael Jordan. Every year was new players. It's college. And I remember he taught me something. He said, Tony, I asked him which one was his team that he was most proud of. And I know a little bit about basketball. I'm old enough to remember Lou Alcindor, Jabbar, remember old Jabbar, people like that. I thought that was going to be the group for sure. The winningest team. That was not the team he picked. He picked the team I'd never heard of. And I said, why that team? They didn't perform as high as these other teams. Why would you pick them as the greatest team you ever worked with? He said, Tony, because they maximized their abilities. He said, you know what? He taught anyone ever worked or was coached by Coach Wooden, he taught people really something simple. He taught them how to be great men. And the way he did it was he said it's really simple. Stop thinking about the score of the game and focus on one thing you can control, how much you give every moment you're on that court. He said there are going to be days when you win and when you lose, but the only days you're going to know when you win or lose are going to be by your measurement of yourself. If every single moment you're on that court, you're engaged at level 10 or above if such a thing were to exist, and you gave every ounce of yourself every minute on the court, then it doesn't matter what the score is you won. Because you became more. And you gave more. And in life, we don't get to keep anything except what we give. Because that's what makes us become something different. His entire mindset, by the way, was if you give your all every single moment on the court, and every one of us does, if all of us are 100% engaged, he said 99% of the time you're going to the highest score. Sometimes someone's going to get lucky. They'll get a different call. The ball will drop. But you can't control that. You can control you. So if you're below an eight, which most of this room is, it might be time to change. And maybe that's what I felt when I walked in this room and the energy was lower. It's like, it's not a judgment. It's just, I want you to have the enjoyment that comes at 10. How many can remember a time where you were so engaged in something that bombs could be going off? You would know you were like right there in the zone. Nothing else could distract you. Who's ever been in that place? Say, I. Make a sound of how it feels when you're in that state. Make a sound. Go for it. Now, make the sound of level seven engagement. And then imagine doing that every day. So then you want to find some new technology that will get you excited again. And the technology is only as good as our engagement. Who's with me on this? Say, I. So now I want to ask you real fast, round robin, while you're standing with your group. 
what makes someone engaging? What makes someone disengaging? Make a list, you have one minute, go. Together, do it together, don't sit down, do it together. Somebody tell me, give me an example of two things that make them engaging, two or three make them engaging, two or three make them disengaging. Anyone, raise your hand, let me grab somebody, we'll grab a microphone. How about, yes sir, right here, give him a hand. Uh, name's Poncho, and I'm from San Luis Obispo. Great, tell us three things that make somebody, make you want to engage with them, tell us three things that make you want to disengage or not be involved with them. Yeah, so engagement, uh, positivity, uh, level-headed, mission-oriented. Okay. Uh, disengaging, unappreciative, grumpy, and unjust. Very nice. Give him a hand. Very nice. Some right. T tell us three things that make people engaging. Tell us three things that make you not want to engage with them or disengage. Uh, empathy, drive, and positivity. Okay. Disengage would be lazy, mean, and somebody that has the worst case scenario attitude. Very nice. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Tell us. And we came up with one person. Three things for someone to be engaging would be drive, positivity, and openness. Great. Um, disengaging would be victim, low energy, and a me, not we attitude. Give her a hand. Thank you very much. Let's see what you do inside yourself to turn on engagement or turn it off. Now, human emotion is energy in motion. That means if you want to change how you feel, you can do it by how you move. If you try to do it with your head, you can go in circles, can't you? Rationalize, go in the nut. So I want you to try something real fast. We're gonna do a real simple exercise. I want you to discover how you can change your own engagement and your own interaction with people by seeing what you do in your body when you go to engage someone. And I'm gonna give you some deliberate scenarios. We're gonna do three real fast. Number one, when I say now, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself to as many people as possible as you can in two minutes. When you do that, I want you to introduce yourself to people you don't know, but I want you to do it from a different emotional state. I want you to do it as if you think this is the stupidest exercise in the world and it's a waste of your time. And why do you have to talk to this idiotic person? In other words, you're not gonna say it, but I want you to walk up to them like it's a total waste of your time. Hi, how you doing? You're gonna shake their hand like, like, like you know, you sir, come here. You, come here, come here. What's your name? What? A Adrian? Adrian. <laughs> Deliberately walk up and be in a state where you really think it's a waste of your time. I don't have to talk to this person, but you're going to do it anyway. And I want you to notice, listen, notice what you do to be in that state in your body. What do you do with your face? What do you do with your breathing? What do you do with your posture? Do you go straight towards them or do you hesitate? I want you to notice not only how it feels to be greeted that way, that'll be obvious. I want you to notice what you got to do to be in a state where you disengage with someone like, well, it's a waste of your time. Get to as many people as you can in a minute and a half. And notice what you do. By the way, you're going to be in a state where you don't want to do this. You're just doing it because you have to. Go. Okay, stop wherever you are in the room. Freeze. Freeze where you are in the room. Now, it wasn't hard for some of you to freeze because you didn't go and you went, hi, hi, I'm done. <laughs> now, how many of you couldn't help yourself? You're like, hi, hi, hi. I saw a few of you out there. How many actually did it? How many actually did it? Raise your hand if you really did it. Say hi. So, I want you to yell out the answer because we have about, what, 7,000 people in this room, and they're from all over the world. So it's a great test ground for human beings. Raise your hand if you had to change your body to go in this lousy state. In some way, raise your hand if you had to change your body. Say, I. I. Raise your hand and say, I, if you change the muscles in your face to get in this little annoyed state. Say, I. I. Uh, tell me, did you, did you increase your breathing more full or more shallow in this state? Shallow. Nice and loud. Which one? Shallow. Which one? Did you talk louder or quieter? quieter. Which one? Quieter. Which one? Quieter. Did you talk faster or slower in this thing? Slower. Which one? Kind of like the room when I walked in here. And I want you to get this. There are 7,000 people here from, what, 100 plus countries? And you're all saying the exact same thing. And I didn't tell you those things you're telling me because in order to go in that crappy state, that's what you all have to do. If you use your body that way, you're going to feel lousy no matter who you're around. And many of us don't. We think it's other people, and it's the state we put ourselves in. So there's a pattern here that's pretty universal, isn't there? So let's try something. Shake that out of your body. Get out of that state. And let's try a totally different state this time. This time, I want you to do this like you're a little kid. If you do it like an adult, you're like, why are we doing this stupid exercise? But if you're a kid, you have fun with stuff. Who's going to have some fun with this? Say, ah. Awesome, then here's what I want you to do. In a moment, I want you to introduce yourself to as many people, different people again, but this time I want you to do it 
from a state where you're deathly afraid they're going to reject you. Okay? Now don't tell me you never, who's ever not done something because you're afraid of being rejected or failing? Raise your hand. Say, I. So wouldn't it be useful to know what you do to put yourself in that place? Because if we know what it is, we can what? Change it. Because it's in your body. It's not just in your head. And when you know the pattern, you can change it. So I want you, when you do this, to exaggerate your fear. Do you know why? Because achievers never get fearful. We just get stressed. And stress is the achiever word for fear, isn't it? If I follow the trail of stress, it'll bring me to your deepest fear. And the fear we all have is I might fail and then it means I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, I won't be loved. Those are the deepest fears that people have inside their head. I want you to do this. I want you to imagine really like a little kid shows their fears. Adults like, I'm not afraid. <laughs> Make this tension in their face, right? Their body. I want you to just really go for it. It's kind of like, you know, like if I came up and said, hi, what's your name? Hey, Bob, how you, how you doing? Give her a hand. It's evolved, ladies and gentlemen. Give her a hand. Kind of like, how many of you in this room have ever watched, like, let's say the Olympics, the Winter Olympics on television? And you're sitting in your chair and you're watching someone skiing or snowboarding as you're sitting to yourself and you're something this. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say hi. I want you to exaggerate so you see what you're doing on a more subtle level. Just one minute, as many people as you can, but like a little kid, you're definitely afraid. And I want you to see what do you do different with your face? Your shoulders, your breath, your voice, the way you shake hands. And let's see if it's different or the same as when you're really annoyed. I think you're gonna find it's quite different. Ready, go. Take your body out, get out of that state. Question, did you use your body the same or different than when you're pissed off and annoyed? Which one? Different. Yes. Raise your hand if you change the muscles in your face in a very different way than when you're annoyed. Raise your hand, say I. I. Did you talk louder or quieter than when you're pissed off? Faster or slower? slower? Yes. Did you go straight for him or hesitate? hesitate? Did you breathe more full or even more shallow than when you're annoyed? Which one? Shallow. Can you hear everyone saying the same thing? What are the chances of 7,000 people from 100 countries without direction saying they're feeling the exact same thing in their body when they're feeling the emotion? It's because we're all unique, but when you use your body one way, you're going to be pissed off. You use another way, you're going to be feeling fearful. And if, how fast can we change how we feel then if all we gotta do is change our movement? How fast? Like that. Let's take one more. Shake your body out. Okay? This time, how many of you own your own business? Let me see your hands. How many of you are leaders of the business? Raise your hand. Okay? How many of you are parents? Raise your hand. How many of you have a relationship? Check this out. A relationship with a human. With a human. <laughs> then this shit's gonna work for you. Here's what I want you to do. When I say now, I want you to greet people, but we're going to change the motivation because I hate the word motivation. I've never been a motivator, but I do believe motive does matter. If your motive is just to manipulate, most of us have pretty giant bullshit meters and we can figure that out at this stage, can't we? I mean, even reality television is bullshit. So we know what's true. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say I. So the motive change is going to be this. I want you to approach somebody and greet people and meet people in two minutes, but we're going to have a different understanding. If this person does not like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you, they don't like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you, they are not going to do business with you and your children are not going to eat next week. <laughs> or just in case you don't have kids, we'll do it this way. If they don't like you in the first three to five seconds, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell. If it was that important, I bet you use your body and face differently, wouldn't you? So, by the way, when you go to do this, I'm talking full tilt like it really is true. And let's see if you use your face, your voice, and your body differently. Ready? Go! If that felt better, say I! I. Say I. I! Question, did you use more of your body or less of your body? More. more muscles in your face or less? More. More voice, louder voice or quieter? Faster or slower than the other two we did? Yes. Did you hesitate or go straight for them? Straight did you touch them? Yes. Did it feel good? Yes. Why? You should have seen who I touched. <laughs> no. Because emotion is created by motion. In other words, listen to me. 
If you use more of the gifts your creator has given you, you will experience the gifts you think you're looking for somewhat. Everything you want, everything you want to feel is already inside you, my friends. Was that the, how many feel very different right now than we began? Raise your hand if you feel much better than we began. Raise your hand, say ah! Say ah! Question, that last greeting you just gave. By the way, do people ever judge, people would never judge someone in real life in the first three to five seconds of meeting them, would they? Was that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Yes or no? Was that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Quick. How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, the majority are saying no. Now, if you're saying no, let's review the assignment, shall we? We said if you don't give your best, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell and you still didn't give your best? We need to talk. You know what, if you said you didn't give your best, I actually respect you. Because what we all know in our souls is, whenever we think we've given our best, what do we always find out? There's always another what? Is it true? So let's go there one final time. You go, what are we gonna do, get naked? No, no, no. Here's what you're gonna do. This time I want you to greet somebody like they're your long lost lover or best friend. Like, oh my God, it's Susie, move, there she is. Oh my God, I see her, there she is. Oh, wow, how are you, wow. So good, to, so good to see you. I want you to greet people like your long lost best friend or lover. One, two, three, go! or less? More. More oxygen or less? More. Did you talk louder or quieter? Louder. Faster or slower? Faster. Did you hesitate or go straight for him? Did you touch him? Yes. Did it feel good? Yes. Why? Oh shit, you already forgot. <laughs> because emotion is created by... Okay. Is there greater engagement right now, yes or no? Yes. Do you enjoy yourself more or less than where we began? and I did nothing, you just decided to engage. In this state, would you be able to engage others, yes or no? Yes. What if they don't want to engage? Come here, you little bastard, I'm gonna hug you. <laughs> you go, I can't go, there's the president of IBM, Charlie! <laughs> I bet it'll change their state. <laughs> how many feel the difference in how you feel right now? Say, I. I. Then don't let this go, and the only way you can do that is if you start to measure. See, we can't manage something we don't measure, you know that. But how often do you measure your state? And yet this is where all engagement comes from. Because if you're not fully engaged, how can you ever expect other people to be? Mark is fully engaged. Agree or disagree? Agree. That's why you're all here. So you must have some respect for this man. I sure do. If you do, you can handle it, right? But see, successful people do what the failures won't. If you do what everybody else does, we know what that is. Come to work with a good state, intending to work hard, positive intent, most people don't come to work to screw off. And you have the best intent, but you're tired. See, I am full of mercury, I'll explain in a moment. That's why I'm sweating so much, I sweat anyway, but I've got mercury poisoning. That's why my body's shaking. But I'm here to give you a million percent. I'll do a million percent, and I've done that for 39 years, every day of my life. That's why I have a brand. You can have a brand too, but you have to measure. You have to say, where am I zero to 10? And if I'm freaking below nine, what am I doing with my life? In an intimate relationship, where are you zero to 10 in your engagement? If that's below nine, you have no passion. You might have love, but you don't have passion. If you're below a seven, you're probably friends. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can have a friend and not be married to them. It's a very different game. I'm suggesting to you that this is the most important element of life because what's gonna make you feel alive is engagement and you're in control of it. How fast can you change your emotional state, your engagement? How fast can you change it, my friends? How fast? By a radical change in your body, you can do it this quick. Try something right now. Make a crazy sound of excitement. Just make a sound, go, make the sound. Try another one. Try another one. 
How many of you used to make crazy sounds when you're a kid for no good reason until people told you to shut up? And you know what? You let yourself become conditioned into what society has taught us to be, to be appropriate. And what that's cost you is spirit. It's cost you the flow. And when you look at the people that you're most entertained by, if you look at, when you watch YouTube, if you watch a business person like Mark, who you really feel moves you, it's because they do what nobody else does because they put themselves in state. He doesn't feel like it every day any more than I do. But he still does it every day. You know why? He does it enough until it becomes him. It's like an athlete. You build muscle. There's emotional muscle. What's more important than emotional muscles? They are the spiritual experience of life. What's more important than courage? Courage unused, what happens to it if you don't engage your courage enough? If you don't engage it over and over again, what's going to happen to it? Grow or shrink? Which one? Faith. Uninvested. What happens to faith that you don't actively use? It dwindles. Passion unexpressed. Does it grow or shrink, my friends? Which one? And everything you want in your life, you can have if you have the resources of these emotions, but these emotions come from being in a peak state. So whether I'm working with presidents of countries, of which I've worked with many, royalty, athletes, the best performers in the world, entertainers, they're all geniuses of this, and I get the phone call because they want to go to the next level because they're already great, but they won't settle because they're always looking to be more. Because they know a 2% difference like this, you take it on a week from now, you know, 10 degree difference, a month from now, six months from now, you have a different life. Or people come see me when they have a challenge. They're either the best in the world or they're challenged. They got a birthday with a zero on it right? They lost their job or they built their company, they sold it for $500 million and now they're bored and they want to figure out what to do. People suddenly, when they get hungry is when they look for answers. I don't deal with people who aren't hungry. They think I'm an idiot, I'm some positive thinking guy because they're never going to investigate the truth. They don't want it. But who comes to me is somebody is hungry. And what we want to do is fan our hunger, but tie to that a new simple discipline. Where am I zero to 10? And if you're below an eight, you're hurting who? yourself. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your business. You're, you're part of that group, even though you probably never identify with that group that's not engaged because you're more engaged than they are, I know. But you're not engaged at the level that you deserve. Who's with me here? Say, I. I. This is what engagement feels like. Now, if you'll sit down, before you do, I would like you to get three crazy hugs and then grab a seat. And we're going to give you one last piece here that's really important. <laughs> now I'd like to give you what I really came for. How many have enjoyed what you've gotten so far here? Say, I. I. Good. My mission is to share something else with you. And I think that you're going to find this may be the most important part of why you came here without even knowing it. And it's simply based on this. I'm totally committed to helping people. My mission is to help people live an extraordinary quality of life. What is an extraordinary quality of life? It's life on your terms. Not mine. It's not my view. What is it you want most? What would your ideal life look like? How would you live? What would you do? What would you share? What would your impact be? And most people have not spent much time thinking about that for a long time because they've been so disappointed. Everybody as a kid thinks this way. And then gradually we have enough disappointments, frustrations, sometimes betrayals from people we care about that we get gun shy and all of a sudden people start going, I'm pessimistic, I'm skeptical. Let's be honest, you're being gutless. It takes no guts to be skeptical. It takes no guts to be pessimistic. It takes no guts to go on the internet where no one knows who you are and write shit about people so you can make yourself feel good by having the illusion you made someone smaller. So you have the illusion you're moving up. And our society is filled with that. So extraordinary life is life on your terms. What would an extraordinary life look like for you? And my bet is most of you have an extraordinary life, but how many of you know how great your life is? How many still want more? Raise your hand if you want more. Say I. How many want more love, more joy, more success, more freedom? How many want all these things? Say, I. I. Then whatever success is for you. Some people, extraordinary life looks like three beautiful children. Some people, extraordinary life is a billion dollar company. Some people's extraordinary life is writing poetry. Some people's extraordinary life is working in the Tenderloin District, helping those people, not just feeding them, but loving them. Everyone's discovered what an extraordinary life is for them. And if you know what it is, that's the first step. Then you need two master skills. Please jot them down. These two skills are what will give you that life. The first skill is the science of achievement. The science of achievement is that whatever you want to achieve, there are rules, and if you follow the rules, you can win the game. 
So for example, if we talk about our bodies, it's a science to be vitally healthy, to be strong, meaning there are rules. Everyone here is biochemically unique, but are there some universal rules that if you violate them, you're gonna have low energy or disease in your body, yes or no? Yes. You bet you will. Are there a set of rules that if you abide by them, you're gonna have an abundance of energy and a vital level of health, yes or no? Yes. So I don't care what you believe, if you jump off a cliff, you are going to drop. I don't care what you believe, if you violate the science of your health, you're gonna have problems. The same thing is true financially. I spent four years, now it's been six, interviewing some of the most brilliant financial minds literally in the world. Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, Ray Dalio. And by the way, one of them I just mentioned, you probably didn't know the name of. How many of you know who Ray Dalio is? Look at this room, 7,000 people, only a couple dozen. The richest people in the world all know who Ray Dalio is. Ray Dalio, you can throw it on the screen, has produced more returns for investors than anyone alive, including Warren Buffett. Everyone talks about Warren Buffett, but Ray Dalio is the guy. Ray's interesting, amazing man. This guy, when I interviewed him, he was, is a man who is the largest hedge fund in the world. Rich people give their money to hedge funds. And when they give it to hedge funds, a big hedge fund might be like 15 billion, raise $165 billion. 10 times bigger than anybody else. When I interviewed him that day, the prime minister of China, the head of China, called, interrupted our call for coaching about what to do with the currency. This is the level. This is a man, to give you an idea, who's produced a 23% compounded return for 21 consecutive years. Think about what all the ups and downs, the bear markets, bull markets, all that stuff. Total genius. You don't know him because you probably couldn't get access to him, to give you an idea. But I got access. It's been a fan of mine, it turned out, for 20 years, which is really helpful. And I went in for a 45-minute interview, and as my nature, I go deep, and four hours later, three and a half hours, I left. And one of the most important questions I asked him was this, because I wanted to write this book, and I wanted to give people, anyone, somebody who's a billionaire or somebody just starting the journey, somebody who's a baby boomer, thinks they can never get free, or somebody like just got out of college, millennial, going, how do I ever get out of debt? I want to be able to help all those people. And by the way, I donated all the profits of that book, $5 million, in advance before it even came out so we could feed 100 million people. That was not 100 million. I had to write some more checks, but it got me started, right? So I asked him, I said, what, what if you couldn't give any of your money to your children and you could only give them a set of principles, a distinctions, a scientific plan, a strategy that would cause them to be financially free what would it be? He said, Tony, and I asked this to every one of these 50 multi-billionaire investors. They all had great answers. His was the best. He said, Tony, I have spent 15 years of my life obsessed with that question. He said, because not only do I want to take care of my kids, but I also have all these charities that when I die, I want those people to continue to be helped. And he said, I have an organization of 1,500 people who work around the clock to come up with the best ideas and they all compete with each other. It's a very, very tough place. This place called Bridgewater where he runs this operation. It's very unique. And it's dog eat dog competition to come up with the best stuff. And he goes, I know I won't be here for that. And he said, I also know that markets are always changing. And he said, I noticed something. Everybody tells you what to do financially and they say diversify and they tell you put this much in bonds and this much in stocks and that's supposed to protect you and he said no one talks about the dirty little secret which is when the markets drop like 2008 2000 it all goes down but no one says anything about it because eventually it comes back and then the same people sold you other things go well that's just the market we don't know what to do and they do the same thing again and it happens again and people can lose half of all they earn overnight right so he said, I want to find a sustainable solution. And he, I'm not going to tell you the details here. It's why I gave you the book, because I want you to have this for yourself. But the bottom line is he laid out this plan. And he's well known for putting together this thing called an all-weather portfolio. All-weather means he doesn't know where the market's going to go. The smartest people in the world are not the ones on CNBC telling you where the market's going to go, because no one knows. The smartest people in the world, every one of them told me, I don't know. Here's what I think, and I'm going to be wrong lots of times. So I diversify and put together a portfolio that'll win no matter what. His has been the most successful. And so I asked him to explain it to me, and he did in detail. Now, I did 18 hours of prep for this one interview with him, and he said on the air multiple times that there's no one that's interviewed him been more prepared for an interview than I. He and I pitched and catch, and because of that, I got to this final level where he explained it to me, and I said, you know what? You just told me the most important set of principles to financial freedom that anyone has ever shared that I'm aware of in the world. He goes, well, that's true. <laughs> he was not, you didn't disagree with me on it. And I said, but there's only one problem. You said, here's how you bake a cake. Use some sugar, use some chocolate, use some dairy products. I said, but you didn't tell me the amounts. 
He goes, Tony, I can't give you that. That's my secret sauce. He goes, you have to have a five billion dollar net worth and you have to give me a hundred million minimum to start or I don't even talk to you and I haven't taken money for 10 years. I said, that's my point. You're not gonna give anybody this anymore. You've closed your fund. You're running it for the people you're running it for and you just done told me that if someone goes to the average advisor, they're good people, but this is a poker game where only the best in the world win at the financial level. Unless your financial advisor is won a bunch of gold medals, he told me, you're screwed. Because it's only a matter of time until there's a real problem. I said, you're the ultimate gold medalist in the whole world, and you know the answer. And I said, you're a totally generous man. You're going to give away half your net worth. I said, why don't you help people right now? Give me the formula. <laughs> and I got him laughing. Once I got him laughing, I knew I had it. And he goes, well, I couldn't do it because I use leverage. I said, design one without leverage for the average person. He goes, well, you know, it wouldn't be perfect. I said, your idea of not perfect, they call him the Da Vinci of investing. Some call him the Steve Jobs of investing. I said, your idea of not perfect would be better than anybody on earth. I said, well, and then he said, let me think. And I felt this tingle down the back of my spine because I wasn't writing this book to make money. I was making this book so I could help people around the world. I watched people in 2008 lose their homes in mass, lose every half of what they had. And that wasn't a statistic. That's how I grew up. So I wanted the answer. And he starts laying this. He goes, well, let's do this. And he gives me this exact formula, which he's never revealed ever in his entire history. I was shaking inside. And he goes, go test that. Go hire someone to test it. And back testing, he goes, back testing doesn't mean anything. You know, past performance doesn't equal future performance because people usually do it over three or four, five or 10 years. Do it over the entire modern year of investing, 75 years, and see how it did. Now think about all the ups and downs in the last 10 or 15 years. 2000 dropped 50%, 2008, 50%. And everybody's waiting for what's gonna happen next. And over all world wars, all that went on. We went and tested, I hired two different firms. One guy called me 11.30 at night. He's never called me 11.30 at night. He goes, Tony, Tony, I gotta talk to you. I said, what happened? He goes, in the last 75 years, this made money 85% of the time. And when it lost money 15% of the time, when it made money, it averaged 10%. When it lost money, the worst loss was 2008, and it was a loss of 3.9%. When everyone's losing 50, that's all he lost. If you could go to Vegas and be right 85% of the time, make 10%, and when the few times you lost, you'd only lose less than 4%, how would he be going to Vegas on a daily basis? So I put that in the book. By the way, all my partners and friends are like, let's make this into a company. Let's, I said, no. This is anybody can do it. And I just gave it to you so you can do it too. And I'll tell you why I gave it to you also. Because this last January, do you remember where the markets were? We had the worst January in the history of the stock market. $2 trillion disappeared. How fast, my friends? In a matter of like 10 days. And everybody, all the rich people and all the successful people in business, including this gentleman over here, they're all in Davos. And so everybody's freaking out. The market dropped like 600 points in the middle of the day. And people are like, well, is this the end? Are we finally seeing the end? And they went to who they go to in, in Davos. They brought in Ray, and he walks up, and Dalio, and they said, what should people do? And Ray's a very quiet, calm guy. He goes, well, Tony Robbins wrote a book where I gave him my formula. <laughs> and he literally said that and described it. And if you'd done what he did, when the market was down, for example, in the very first month down 10%, and people are freaking out, he was up 1%. Right now, as of two days ago, I don't know what it is today, I didn't look, but as of two days ago, the market was 7.8%. This is up 12.21. Uh, 12 it's 47% greater than the market. And you do it once a year. You adjust it once a year. Now, I'm not telling you to put all your money in there. I just want you to know there's a science to achievement. And that's true of finance. That's true of your body. That's true of a lot of things. And by one more thing I'll tell you. I have a partnership now with the number one rated firm. I'll throw it up on the screen for you if you're interested. A gentleman who's rated number one wealth manager three years in a row by Barron's. No one's done that in history. It's called creative planning. And the last two years, he's been number one wealth manager in America by CNBC. We have 20 billion in assets. I'm on the board of directors. I'm also the chief investor psychology and I'm Peter's partner. So if you go there, I benefit so you know. But I want you to know, if you wanna get a second opinion, he'll do it for you for free. And the reason he's rated number one is most wealthy people have what's called a home office, where they have a group of people, not somebody just selling you a product. You have somebody who's a fiduciary. It means legally they have to put your needs ahead of their own. If they told you to buy Apple this morning and they buy it this afternoon cheaper, they have to give you their stock. 
Peter's number one in that area. So if you want, you can go to getasecondopinion.com. That's my commercial for you. But he'd do a review for you. You can implement it yourself or you can work with him. But the level of detail he does is amazing. So I gave you the book. So if you want to take care of that in your life, you can. But my larger point is simple. There's a science to achievement. And the science of achievement can get you from where you are to where you want in anything. And the way you speed it up is you find who's most successful and you model them. Write down this. Success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. If someone is able to succeed year after year after year, like Adalio, like, you know, Peter at Creative Planning, then perhaps they're not just lucky and you might want to find out what they're doing and avail yourself of it because you can press decades into days. You can have trial and error learning or you can go to someone's already figured it out and say, how do I do this and save yourself that time? I'm here today because my whole life has been modeling people so I could achieve more. But here's why I came this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever the hell it is now. I came here because my deeper mission is for you to master the second key to an extraordinary life. And it's the one our culture values a lot less. And it's a hell of a lot more important. And when I tell you, you're not going to be impressed. You're going to go, that's it? Because that's the way we're trained to think. The second master lesson to an extraordinary life is the art of fulfillment. The art, jot it down, of fulfillment. What do I mean by the art of fulfillment? Success is a science. What do I do to succeed in business? There's a science. There's a set of rules. But what fulfills us is totally different. Look at this woman's glasses right here. Take a look at these glasses here. Can, you see these? Can we get a camera on these glasses? These are very special glasses. No, not me, her. There they are. There's the glasses. No, look towards the camera, where the hell that is. So she has got a very special idea of these glasses. You can't really tell if they're still at an angle here. My point is, these glasses, what do you think of these glasses? I think they're awesome too. I don't see anybody else with glasses like you. That's right, because these fulfill her. Other people go, what are those crazy ass glasses she's wearing, right? Right? We're all different. I'll give you an example. Steve Wynn is one of my dearest friends and a, a, one of my clients, as I said earlier, built half of Las Vegas, right? Multi-billionaire, started with less than nothing. His dad went broke, had a $400 million debt. He left college, figured out how to pay that off, keep his family above ground, and now one of the richest men in the world and very brilliant guy. And I'm having these conversations with Steve, and I'm thinking to myself, I, I, he calls me, first of all, and he says, Tony, where are you? And I'm thinking, why is he asking that? And I said, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. We both have vacation homes there. He goes, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. He goes, guess what? I said, what? He goes, it's my birthday. Aren't you going to come see me? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, of course I'm going to come see you, Steve. I didn't know you are here, but of course, love to. He goes, Tony, really, I want you to come over because he said, I gave myself a birthday gift. There is a painting that I have coveted for, I can't remember the number of years, like 18 years, I'm making it up, but almost two decades. And he goes, I've coveted it, I've wanted it, it finally came up for sale. And he said, I outbid everybody at Sotheby's for it. And he said, I paid $82 million for this painting. And I'm like, wow. So picture what you think an $82 million painting means to you. My picture was like a Rembrandt, something, you know, from, you know, that period at least, right? You know, just something gorgeous, I don't know, something religious, spiritual, something. And so I drive to his house and I got all this anticipation to see what this painting's gonna be like. Steve's such a wonderful human being, rugs me in, he goes, Tom, come on, check this out. And he walks me in the room and there on the wall is this painting. Put it up on the screen so people see it. <laughs> and I looked at it and I said, I paused, I held my breath for a moment, I said, Steve, I thought it was like the emperor's new clothes. I said, dude, it's a red orange square. <laughs> He's, no, no, it's a Rothko. I said, I know, but it's a red orange square, $82 million. I said, dude, give me a hundred bucks in an hour. I can do this shit. I promise you. <laughs> you didn't like that. I got him laughing, right? You know, but here's why I tell you the story, because what will excite you and fulfill you will be different than this person, even if that's your son, different than this person, different than you. Even though we may love each other, what fulfills us is not a science. It's an art. And if you don't know what's going to fulfill you, what are you doing all this for? How many people do you know that achieved their ultimate goal? Have you ever done this? Ever achieved a goal and then your brain went, is this all there is? Who here has ever had this moment? Raise your hand, say I. Isn't that moment worse than failing? Because most of us in this room, if you fail, you don't fail. What do you do? You get up and just what? Try something else. You're gonna keep persisting till you find it, right? But if you succeed and you're unhappy, now you're what I call technically screwed, <laughs> right? I mean, it's the worst feeling in the world because you're just not fulfilled. So every one of us needs something different to have that sense of fulfillment. But I can tell you two things that we all need to be fulfilled as principles, not as rules. 
Number one, we must grow. If you don't grow, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter how many Academy Awards you have, it doesn't matter how many people respect you, it doesn't matter if you have four perfect children, it doesn't matter if you have so much love, you're not gonna feel it. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. So if we don't grow, we what? You grow or you die. If you don't grow your business, it's dying. If, you don't, if your relationship's not growing, it's dying. There's no plateau. Who's with me on this here? Raise your hand, say I. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. I feel like we lost in this country a national treasure a little bit more than two years ago. I'm talking about Robin Williams. How many of you in this room, I want you to raise your hand, not if you liked Robin Williams. Raise your hand if you loved this man. Raise your hand if you loved him. Keep your hand up nice and high if you would. Keep your hand and look at the number of people that love this man. It's 98% of the room. There's only 2% assholes in this room that didn't like Robin Williams. <laughs> I've asked this question this year in Sydney, Australia, in Tokyo, in uh, Beijing, China, in uh, South America, in Peru. I've been all over the world. I've did 16 countries this year. Every place I've asked, every place I've gone, and every language being translated, on average, 98% of people raise their hand saying they loved him. And I always say, don't raise your hand if you liked him. Now, here's my question about this incredible soul, Robin. Was he a master of the science of achievement, yes or no? Yes or no? He had a dream to go to Hollywood and do his own TV program. How many people have that dream and how many actually get it? He did it. He had a dream to not only have his own TV show, but he was gonna make it number one. And some of you are ancient enough like me to actually remember that show, what was it called? Mork and Mindy. Some of you, it's replayed enough, you still know about it, right? Number one show. Then he said, I want to have the most beautiful family. And he did it. Achieved it. Then he said, I want to have more money than I could ever spend. And he achieved it. Then he said, I want to make movies. And he did it. Then he said, I want to make movies. And I want to make movies. And I want to win an Academy Award. Watch this. For not being funny. His primary skill. And he won an Academy Award for drama. For dramatic performance. He did all of that. And then he hung himself. How do you explain that? Now some people say, well, he had Parkinson's, he had this, he had that. He suffered his whole life. He used alcohol, he used cocaine, he used everything he could get his hands on because he made everybody happy except whom? Himself. And he left a beautiful bride, wife, and children who loved him, and hundreds of millions, maybe a billion, I don't know the real number, I can only tell you anecdotally, Every country I've been in, 98% of the people translated in those countries tell me they loved him and it wasn't enough. Yes, he had Parkinson's later, he had Lou, Lou, what are they called, Louis bodies in his brain, but he suffered his whole life because he suffered because he made everyone happy. He never mastered the art of fulfillment. He thought it was all about the science of achievement. That's why I came by today, because you guys are masters of achievement or you wouldn't be in a room like this. And I know there's different levels of achievement, but it's all relative, right? If you're in a room like this, you're hungry, you're driven, you're some of the best, you came here because you want more. You don't settle like most people. But I'd hate to have you wake up someday, I know you're not gonna hang yourself, but to have that emotion of feeling like life is not the richest experience that it could be, and it's only because you were so driven by the cultural conditioning of achievement. And I'm not suggesting don't achieve. I achieve, but I also am fulfilled. I know people that are so fulfilled. This little character over here is massively fulfilled because he knows it isn't just achievement. It's really about something bigger. He's got a mission. He's got a sense of meaning. He knows what fulfills him and he lives it. Richard Branson is one of the most fulfilled human beings you're gonna meet. It isn't because he's a multi-billionaire. He's achievement, but his great benefit is he's fulfilled. I can't name a dozen people I've met and I've met 10 million people, 50 million I've worked with, but 10 million people that I've had these deep relationships with and at least 50 multi-billionaires, and I couldn't name more than a half dozen that I could tell you honestly are really truly fulfilled by their own description without bullshit. It ain't money that's gonna do it for you. It's not achievement that's gonna do it for you. So the best time to wake up will be now. And so this experience is what my life's work is, is to get people to experience the joy while you're here. And if you'd asked me a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, was I living that? I'd say, of course I am. 
and I would have believed it 100%. I was. I've had the most amazing wife. I have a woman as my wife who I would die for. Been together 17 years. I'm not blowing smoke. This woman is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, my wife. And it, it gives me, if I had nothing else in my life, I have four amazing children. I have three grandchildren. I've got 31 companies. I got a thousand employees. I'm in all these industries. I got to do what I want, when I want, at the level I want. I have financial freedom, all those things. And I come from nothing. So I'm proud I did achieve. But more importantly, because it's been meaningful the way I've done, I felt fulfilled. That's why I'm here. I don't need to be here. I didn't come here for money. I didn't come here for a talk. I didn't come here to pump you up. How do we create that fulfillment? Here's what I found out. I've always talked about, even as I started this morning, this afternoon, we talked about high energy, right? Energy rich. By the way, financially poor is not as bad as energy poor. You low in energy, everything's going to break down. Your relationship's going to break down. How are you going to have passion when you're exhausted all the time? You might love each other, but you're not going to have real passion. How are you going to be a great parent when you're exhausted all the time? How are you going to create breakthroughs when you're making it through the day? And what sucks the energy out of us is not food or sleep. We can do with those things. They're important. We can do without them at times if we have to. It's lack of meaning. And we're ending a world that's about to disrupt itself massively because the very technology we're creating is going to disrupt, according to Oxford, 40% of all jobs over the next 15 to 18, 20 years. What are we going to do in four or five years when there's three million truck drivers in this country and Ford just announced in four years they'll have self-driving trucks? Why would I hire someone who can only work eight hours legally because i got to give them rest when I can have a truck that will do 24 hours and it doesn't crash and it doesn't get drunk and it doesn't give me shit and attitude? And I can depreciate it. And that technology will get better and better geometrically. And no one is preparing those truck drivers. We're going to have a massive disruption in our culture. So maybe what we really got to do is really decide how to make sure we find ecstasy in this moment right now. Because whatever challenges are, let me tell you something. Problems and happiness have no relationship. Can you have huge problems and still be totally happy? Yes or no? Come on, guys. Yes or no? But our brain, the mind won't tell you that. You're more than your mind. You got a heart, you got a soul, you got a spirit. But most of us, because of technology, have gone more and more here. And this is a great tool, the mind. But you got to train it to do what you want. Some people have seen, any of you see my documentary, uh, um, I'm Not Your Guru? Did anybody see it by chance? Awesome. You know, one of the things people ask me about is, why do you jump in that 56 degree water every day? Are you insane? And I do it because it's a discipline where I've trained my mind. When I tell it what to do, we don't negotiate. I don't let my mind run me. I let my heart and soul run me. And I've trained this brain to use, to use it when I need it for strategy, for tools. But your mind will never make you happy. Only your heart will. Your mind won't even allow you to enjoy an apple. If you drive the apple, it's going to go, is it organic? <laughs> Where did it come from? Where do I put it? Where do I throw it away? The mind is just, how many know what I'm talking about here? Say, I. So one of the pieces that will shift things for you is, instead of energy rich or energy poor, high energy or low energy, I was in India with a dear friend of mine named Krishna Jay, and he said, Tony, what if you switched those words and just called it beautiful states, high energy states, and low energy states are suffering states? I said, well, that, I think that would be an accurate description. He goes, well, then... Let me tell you what my spiritual vision is. I said, okay, tell me your spiritual vision. He said, to live in a beautiful state every day, no matter what, even when it doesn't go my way, because life is too short to suffer. Who believes that, by the way? Say, I. And I, I was intrigued. I said, he said, why? He said, why, why do you call that your spiritual vision? He goes, because when I'm in a beautiful state, I don't have to think about how to treat other people. I always do the right thing. And when I'm in a suffering state, even though I'm a good human being, I treat people poorly. So let's talk about it for a moment. If I asked you one of the greatest experiences of your life, what was it? A moment. I'm sure you've had many. Pick one. What's been one of the most beautiful, magical, magnificent, sacred, sexy, sensual, loving, meaningful experiences of your life? Just one of them. I know you've got plenty. If we went through that, you could tell me the story, but I'm out of time, so you can't tell me the story. <laughs> But if you told me the story and we did this for a while, which I've done with people before, you'll always see the same pattern. The pattern of what makes you most alive is things that give you these emotions you want most. Beautiful states like love or joy or gratitude or excitement or hunger or drive or creativity. See, you don't just have happiness. If it's only one state you're going after, your brain needs variety. 
Ever, you know, ever been so happy you smile so much your face hurt? Who knows what I'm talking about here? So we need lots of beautiful states. But here's what I could tell you. When you're in a beautiful state, everything goes. Now, what's a suffering state? I don't, I don't think anyone in this room might could be wrong. I sure know if you would ask me a year and a half ago, do I suffer? I would have laughed. Suffer? Are you kidding? You see my wife? See my wife? See what I got to do? See who my friends are? I have the most magnificent life. And I wouldn't be even being phony. I was being totally authentic. It's just, just like achievers aren't fearful, they get stressed. No achiever suffers, but they do. Because it's not consistent. That word's not consistent with our identity, is it? But what if suffering was any state that takes you out of your heart and soul and makes you feel fulfilled, like frustration, anger, overwhelm, stress, worry, concern. And by the way, I would get pissed off and frustrated, but I would say to myself, that's not suffering, that's part of life. That's what I believe, and whatever you believe, you'll live. And I then began to realize, no, it's not. Suffering states are the result of the brain. We have a two million year old brain in our bodies and it's designed not to make you happy. It's designed to make you survive. And that's what almost everybody does, they survive. Happiness is your job. And I just come by to remind you how you can do it and have it be sustained if you wanna know who's interested. If you wanna be happy, here's my question first. How many of you in this room want to be happy for the rest of your life, no matter what? Let me ask you a second question. How many are not just wanting it, are totally committed to be happy every single day for the rest of your life? You say that now. The only way you can have that is you, you make the connection that problems and happiness have no relationship. How many of you know somebody who has a life you'd love to have and they're still pissed off or worried or concerned or freaked out? Raise your hand, right? You go, if I was there, I wouldn't feel that way. Bullshit. Because the mind is always looking for something because this two million year old brain is basically survival software. And what it's doing is always looking for what's wrong. And whatever you look for, you'll find. Try this for a second. Look around this room and look for everything that is brown. As fast as you can, I'm gonna test you. Look around anywhere, anything that's brown. Brown clothing, brown people, brown anything, look for it. Look for brown, look for brown, I'm gonna test you. Look behind you, don't miss anything that's brown. Look for brown, look for brown. Close your eyes. Tell me everything you just saw that was red. <laughs> Raise your hand if you saw a lot more brown than red. Raise your hand, say I. Open your eyes, look for red now. Look for red, look for red, everywhere. Look for red, anywhere you can find it. Look for red, look for red. Raise your hand if you found a lot more red this time and say I. Why did you find more red this time? Because in an old book called the good book, it says seek and ye shall. In fact, seek and we shall find. Whatever you look for, you're gonna find, even if it's not there. I'll prove it to you. How many saw beige shit called it brown just to feel successful? How many saw burgundy and called it red just so you could get bigger points? If you think someone's a jerk, will you find jerkiness in them? Even if that's not there, won't you shade it? Yes or no? If you think they're a good person, will you find goodness in them? Yes or no? If you think you're a jerk, will you make yourself in a jerk by finding some part of yourself? Yes or no? So we get what we look for. The brain is looking for what's wrong. Remember this as long as you live. What's wrong is always available. So is what's right. It's all a matter where you go. And this brain, survival software, is looking for what's wrong so it can fight it or flight it. But there's one problem. We don't have a saber tooth tire to run from anymore. So now it makes up things like, oh my God, what are people thinking of me? So I better shade the picture that I put on Instagram so I really come across even better. Or do I have enough money in a country here in the United States, for example, where the poorest of the poor, and I, I, you know I'm focused to help the poor. I was the poor. But if you're in poverty in the United States, or you're one of those people marching saying those 99, we're 99 percent, or those 1 percent jerk offs, they don't care about anybody, you're lying when you do that, because you're the 1 percent of the world. If you're in poverty in the United States, you're the 1 percent of wealth in the world. But conveniently, you're not thinking about those people, only about yourself. And the reason is, write this down. Suffering always comes from an obsession with yourself. Suffering disappears when you're trying to give or focus or share beyond yourself. When you obsess, not when you take care of yourself, we've got to take care of ourselves, but when you obsess about yourself, it's there. A woman says to me, no, it's not, I'm not obsessed about myself, I'm obsessed about my children. My children, I'm so worried, they're not doing well, they're, they're, one of them's on drugs. And I said, yes, but the real reason you're suffering is because you feel you failed them. 
If you ever look at when you continuously suffer, it's because you're focused on yourself. Raise your hand if you can see this, right? If you think about the thoughts, what you're not getting, what you're not experiencing, what you're not finding. And what's interesting is when we're inside our own head about ourselves, we're in that survival software, and we go into this scarcity that freaks us out, and we don't treat people well. Somebody asked me just recently, they said, how do you explain what kind of person could do what we saw in Nice, we saw in Paris, we saw in San Bernardino, we saw in Orlando, like go in some place and kill other human beings, men, women, and children. They don't even know, cold-blooded murder. I said, I can't tell you who did it, but I can tell you who didn't do it. It wasn't a fulfilled person. It wasn't a happy human being. Happy human beings, fulfilled human beings, human beings in beautiful states don't try to hurt other people. They don't try to steal from other people. They don't try to tear other people down. They don't write shit about them on the web. And they sure as hell don't kill people, plant bombs, or shoot people with bullets. It takes a really disturbed person to do that. And you know what? Most people are disturbed at times because the mind will make you disturbed even though you're not. Because it's a device. It's gonna fight or it's gonna flight. And if you let this run your life, you go to sleep, you're gonna have the pain that all of us feel at times. But I came by today to remind you that you're in charge and that you can change it with just a couple of distinctions. And what are those distinctions? Number one, you have to first identify that you do suffer, even though you would never say that. I would never say I'd suffered. I'd say, well, of course I get pissed off and frustrated, but that's such a minority of my time. Is any moment worth suffering over in this life? And when you're suffering, by the way, Suffering begets more suffering. Is it true? When you're suffering, do you affect other people? Even if you don't try to hurt them to say something, do they feel it? Do your kids, does your husband, does your wife, do your coworkers feel when you're suffering, yes or no? So you're stealing from that energy. And it's simply because you didn't do the following steps. Here they are. Want to know them? Here they are. One, you got to identify your favorite flavor of suffering. Because we all have one. Is yours worry? Is it pissed off? Is it concern? Is it feeling less than, feeling not enough? What is your favorite flavor of suffering? What is the emotion that puts you in a state that's unresourceful? And when you're unresourceful, it's hard to solve it, isn't it? You might say, but I want to just go solve this. You can solve your problem so much faster in a resourceful state, in a beautiful state, than a problem state. Because when you're not hooked, you can get through to people. But when you're hooked, people feel that, and they don't know how to react to it. And it fires off their suffering. And people, they unconsciously start to not connect. And then we end up with that disengagement that at the lowest level shows up in business and the most important level shows up in your intimate life with those you love. And so if we want to change it, you got to discover. So what, if I asked you right now, young lady with the glasses, you stand out so nicely, what's your favorite flavor of suffering? That I'm not enough. What's your favorite flavor of suffering, sir? Not being recognized. Well, shit, you just got in front of 10 million people across the web and... Yeah, you're doing good. We'll shine your head up, give you a little kiss with that. You're, you're, you're acknowledged now, right? Okay? What is your most favorite flavor of suffering? Worry, right? Mine was frustration. You know what I found out? I realized my happiness was so cheap. All it took was this for me to become unhappy. Because remember I told you, I got 31 companies, seven different you know, areas, different types of businesses all around the world, 1,000 employees. I got a question for you. What are the chances that somebody's screwing something up right now with that many companies all around the world on three continents, thousand plus people? What are the chances somebody's messing something up right now? What are the chances? Tell me quick. 100%. And all I need is to have this nearby. Look at it. There's one right there. There's a text. I can see it. Somebody's messed something up. And what is mess something up? What did it take for me to lose my happiness? Someone not to do what I think they should do ideally now. And the more people you care about, the more people you interact, the more the greatest chance that this is going to be happening all the time. So I'd find myself happy, happy, happy. Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, man. I'd use a different word. F, you know, something, you know. When I was really suffering, I'd go to a different language. Who knows what I'm, who, who uses different language when you're suffering? Let me see if your hands here. Right? Part of you know you're suffering by the language you use. And so I began to realize I'm giving up my happiness over this. If in order for you to be happy, everybody's got to do what you think they should do, you're never going to sustain happiness. I would love for you to be happy the rest of your life. I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how because I'm doing it. You have to decide what's your favorite way of suffering, and then you have to make the most important decision of your life. And I never would have said this before. I would have said the most important decision of your life, I believe in the past, is who you love. Who you spend time with is who you become.
I still think that's one of the most important decisions of your life. But my wife and I both agree now, the most important decision is deciding not to suffer anymore, that life is too short, and that you're gonna find joy, beautiful states in every moment, and you're committed to it even when it doesn't go your way, even when it rains on your parade. See, I don't want you to ever feel pain if I could help it. I don't know you, but I hate suffering because I grew up suffering. I had four different fathers. I had a mother that loved me. Achieva beat the hell out of me. She put liquid soap down my throat till I threw up because she thought I was lying and I wasn't. I mean, it was crazy stuff. But if she'd been the mother I wanted, I would not be the man I'm proud to be. Because I, I wouldn't have this dry. Why would I be here? Why would I go feed a billion people? Why would I do the things I'm doing? So you know what? Sometimes not getting what you want is what makes you into something that's got something more to give. So if you make this decision, I don't want you to ever have pain if I could help it, but I can't. So that means you make the decision, I'm gonna be happy even if someone I love dies. Because what good is it for you to live in suffering when they die? Would they want that? But we have cultural conditioning that makes us think that we're supposed to do this. And so many people think suffering is a positive emotion or it's noble. Suffering people don't inspire others. They don't lift others. See, while you're suffering, you're not there for the other people that don't understand what you know, who are crying, that are hurting, and you could be comforting. But you can't do it when you're suffering. You're inside of you. Who understands what I'm talking about here? Say, I. So if you make the decision, when I say a decision, most people's idea of decision, they state a preference. I've decided I'm gonna do this, but they aren't committed. If you're totally committed, what do you do? I always tell people, if you wanna take the island, burn the boats. Because as long as there's a way out, our brains will take it. So my invitation to you is really simple. You can get free of suffering, but in order to do it, you gotta realize it's all your expectations that make you suffer. I'll give you one quick example. I'm fortunate enough, like Mark, I have my own plane, so I can fly you know, anywhere in the world, and I traveled this last year to 16 countries, so it's a great privilege to have a bed and go straight to China nonstop, unbelievable. But most of my life, I took commercial aircraft, and uh, after a while, I started chartering in the U.S., but going overseas was too expensive, so I didn't do that. I, so I found half my time I was on an airplane. About every four days, I was on an airplane or on stage, one of the two. Pretty intense life. So interesting enough, in those days, I go three times a year to Australia. I still do, but in those days, commercially, and I get on Qantas Airlines on a flight. You're in San Francisco or L.A. in those days, and it's a 14-hour flight, and there was just one problem. 31 companies in those days. It was like two dozen companies or, or 15 companies. I got all these people I'm responsible for. I'm a committed guy. And what, how am I connected 24-7, right? We all know what it is. It's all these tools that we develop, all this technology. But I was used to domestically, you got connection to the internet, even while you're flying. But you get on that 14-hour flight, <clears throat> death, no technology, no web. And I was like so frustrated. Why do they do this? These 14 hours, they can be so productive. Oh, my God. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Get a sense of what I'm talking about. So what happens? One day after years of going through this, before I had my own plane, I'm on, I'm on this flight, and Qantas Airlines announces we're about to take off. Guess what? We can now proudly tell you we now have international internet. And it was like people cheered. Some people stood up in the aisles and clapped. I didn't, but I felt like doing it. It was just like, this is incredible. It's like God descended into the building. We have internet. We got Instagram. We got Facebook. We got email. This is the most amazing thing. And then what do you think happened within 15 minutes? What do you think happened? Tell me, come on. It broke down. And when do you think it worked again? Never. 14 hours without it. And people are like, this is bullshit. I can't believe this crap. I'm not putting up with 15 minutes earlier, it was a miracle. Now it's already an expectation. <laughs> Write this down. If you want to change your life, trade your expectations for appreciation and your whole life will change in that moment. Trade your expectations for appreciation and your whole life will change in that moment. If you are suffering, there's only one reason. Things aren't meeting your expectations. What are the chances of everyone in your life meeting your expectations for the rest of your life? What are they? What are your expectations that God or the universe will meet your expectations every moment? See, I'd like you, are you married, sir? Is she here? Oh, she's with your twins. How beautiful. Congratulations. I would never want to see you have any pain if I could ever avoid it, if I could do anything about it, but I'm not God. So I could do something different since I'm not God. 
I can get you to consider something that if you did it would give you freedom. It would be an absolute commitment in yourself to say life is too short to suffer. God has given me this creation and I'm gonna love every moment. I'm gonna find ecstasy every moment of my children, even when they do crazy shit, even when they're rugrats. I'm gonna have with my wife, even when she doesn't seem to be listening to me or my husband isn't. I'm gonna do it even if she left me. I can't control her leaving you, but I can control one thing. You can make the decision that you are gonna find beauty in everything in life and you're gonna learn from everything in life and that is the only way you'll be out of suffering. Otherwise, it won't matter how much money you make, it won't matter how many people love you, it doesn't matter how many great kids you have. Are there gonna be disasters and challenges for all of us, yes or no? Yes or no? All of us, I don't care how rich you are financially, I don't care how smart you are, I don't know if you have an IQ of a genius, I don't care if you've got the biggest company in the world, Every person in the room is going to experience extreme stress in your future. Everyone here will have something, a robbery, a house that burns down, an earthquake, somebody that cheats you, somebody steals money from you, somebody you totally trusted and then they screw you over, somebody that betrays you. Aren't you glad you came to this positive seminar? <laughs> See, you thought it was Mr. Positive Thinking. You're so wrong. See, I'm a realist. I don't believe, I'm not stupid. I don't think that everybody, I know that most people are not fit and healthy. Most people around the world do not have a relationship where they're totally passionate. Most people do not love their work. True or false? But a few do. I'm interested in the few who do versus the many who talk. I'm interested in the few that live in beautiful states versus the masses that suffer. And I also know that anyone can end that suffering in a moment if you make the decision that says, I have decided from this day forward, I'm going to find beauty in everything by being in a beautiful state. And that means if you start to suffer, by the way, you're going to suffer. We all do. Because this brain is two million years old. And it's going to keep acting. It's going to keep looking what's wrong. But the difference is when it comes in, if you've made the decision, you'll start to suffer. And I created for myself a 90-second rule. I got 90 seconds. Get this shit out of me. And those 90 seconds, I figure out what it is. And I know how to stop suffering. I'm suffering because I'm having an expectation that's not being met. And while I think it's life and death, it's just my preference. It's my preference that you guys had more energy than we started. It's my preference that you'd have a great time. It's my preference that my kids would do everything I want them to do. It's my preference that all my employees across all these companies will do all the right things every day. God will laugh at your preferences. And what I found is I have my preferences, which are wonderful, but I'm still gonna live in a beautiful state because life is precious. Hey, what if you were God? And you come down and you talk to one of your creations and you say, how's it doing down here? How's it going down here on earth? What do you think? And a person that you're talking to that you created goes, well, God, I mean, you could have done a better job. I mean, come on. Why'd you make it so freaking foggy here in San Francisco? I couldn't land my plane the other day. And why would you go planes that could cut through the fog? I mean, you're God. And why did you make all these irritating people? You know, I had so many irritating people. They try to stop me from doing things. And, you know, and, and, and also it's just like, why didn't you just make me rich? Why do I have to work? And besides that, you even got these little ants. You know those little red ants? They're like this small, and they bite the shit out of me. Why would you create those for me? If you heard all this bitching and you were God, would you want to hang out with this person? If you were God, you might, you know, say, I don't know. What if you go to somebody else, you go, what do you think? One of your other creations. And that person says, God, you're amazing. This is the most beautiful place on earth. This is heaven. This is extraordinary. I mean, there's so many different kinds of people and they challenge me in so many different ways. I have to grow to understand them and understand myself. And, and, and you make the fog and you make the sun and it's always changing so I'm never bored. And you make these little red ants, damn, they're courageous. They'll, I'm 10,000 times their size and they'll bite my ass. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Who would you want to spend time with? The first person or the second one if you were God? Which one? So if you're not experiencing God, perhaps you're bitching too much Perhaps it's not God, perhaps it's you and you're whining and you're suffering. So I want to finish with this. If you want to stop suffering, first, you got to know how you suffer and recognize and be honest. Second, you can't tolerate. We all get what we tolerate. So you have to make the decision. I'm going to be in a beautiful state the rest of my life. It doesn't have to be happy. It could be determined. It could be curious. It could be committed. It could be energized. It could be grateful. It could be loving. It could be happy. It could be any of these. But I am going to be that every day because I'm capable. And I've shown you earlier you are, because how fast can you change your state, my friends? How fast? Come on, guys, how fast? If you stop using your mind and you use your body and your heart, your spirit, 
That's what will put you there. The mind won't keep you there. It might get you there for a, when things go your way, your mind will feel happy. But what happens when they don't? I was talking to a man the other day, and he was telling me all about his company, and he lost the company, built it up, and it was a billion-dollar company. And then, you know, the venture capitalist guys voted him out of his own company. I said, welcome to Steve Jobs' world. And then he told me this new company he's creating, but he doesn't want to put it into it. He's afraid of getting hurt again. I said, you lost that company for a reason. Perhaps it's so you can build this company, which is going to save people's health. What if you and I... We stop the suffering by having one new belief. Here's what I believe in my soul. Life is always happening for us, never to us. We think it's happening to us because of our minds, but it's all happening for us, even the pain, even the disappointment, even the problems. If my mother had been the mother I'd wanted, I would not be here today. I would not be, if my father had not left, I would not feed a billion people, much less 100 million, much less 1,000. Maybe life isn't always about getting your preferences. Maybe life is about you becoming more. And when you do, you feel more alive and you have more to give, and that's the purpose of life. Because when we're giving, we're outside of ourselves. There's no suffering when we're giving. In fact, when you're most happy and excited about something, what's the first thing you want to do? How many of you, the minute something great happens, you want to share it with somebody you love? Raise your hand if that's what you want to do. Say, I. Why? Because when you share it, there's only so much you can feel inside. Even if it's sex or rock and roll, love, drugs, whatever you think is going to make float your boat, money. You only feel so much. But when you share it, it multiplies. So here's the antidote suffering. Identify your favorite flavor. Make the decision that says, I will not suffer. I'm going to live in a beautiful state no matter, no matter what if it rains on your parade. What if your best friend screws you over? What if somebody yells at you? What if you get humiliated? What if you go broke? What if you lose your job? Could you still be happy, yes or no? Are there people who have lost arms, legs, been blinded, lost their family, and they're still loving and happy and beautiful, yes or no? And they aren't just Mother Teresa. They're not just Nelson Mandela. They're any human being that decides to live where it's not about themselves. Sisters, I love you so much. You, well, the reason I want to support you, the reason you made those prayers that I decided I was going to fulfill those for you is because you don't just feed people. You love people, people that no one else, people have forgotten. And you're there every day and you ask for nothing. And I know that's why you're fulfilled. And I honor you both. I love you. The best way to end suffering is kill the monster while it's little. Don't wait till it's Godzilla eating your whole city in life. If you turn yourself and train yourself to do it. And by the way, I did this a year and a half ago. And to give you an idea, what happened was I felt the most joy I've ever felt in my life, and then I had three incidences. And you understand how I entered the room. I've been on stage for 39 years, working with 50 million people. I give my all every day. This is easy. This is three hours. My average seminar is 50 hours. My stress here is three hours. Because I don't like to talk. I like to go deep, as you might gather. And I like to condition it where we get up and do things. And there's only so much time. And those 50 hours, I go full tilt. And I've been doing that for 39 years, and I clap like a crazy man. I jump much more intensely in here because I'm toning it down for you guys because you think I'm crazy when I first come in, especially where you guys started with your energy. I look like a maniac. But what I found in that time is doing that, hammering like that, it damaged the nerves in my arms, and so all of a sudden I couldn't sleep on my side, which I've done my whole life. No big deal. I'll sleep on my back. It's painful. Who cares? I manage pain. Every great athlete does that. Every good person does that. But then my wife is freaking out, saying, honey, you're, you're choking, you're not breathing. And I was exhausted, and I went in and did a sleep study and found I had sleep apnea. But it was extreme. In 17 minutes, I stopped breathing 18 times. That doesn't make for very much rest. That doesn't make for health. So now I have this really sexy device. It's called a sleep app. You stick it on your face. It's a mask, and it pours oxygen, and you will get girls with this shit, I promise you. But they'll be in the hospital, the girls that you'll get, right? And so I'm like, I can't believe this. I'm, I'm breathing through this breather now because of these nerves. And then I'm going, I'm kind of crazy. I'm snowboarding and I rip three rotator cuffs. Not a problem. It's painful. I'll get it worked. But then the pain won't go away and the pain becomes nerve pain that's shooting so bad. I know how to deal with pain. But on a zero to 10, 9.9. .9. And it's so severe, I can't sleep. I'm in so much pain. And I don't want to do surgery. And the surgeon says, well, it's in your spine. He comes in and tells me it's not just your rotator cuffs. You have something called spinal stenosis where it's tightening around your spine and crushing the nerves. And there really isn't a solution. We can do surgery, but it's no guarantee and there's side effects. And the guy, by the way, first tells me, oh, I've been to your business mastery program. I'm, I'm making a million, two more a year. And I went to this other pro. He's telling me, you changed my life. And he goes, I got to tell you, I'm your doctor. I'm going to show you something. Your life is over. 
That was his bedside manner. I had not trained him, obviously, in these communication tools. And he told me, I can't snowboard, I can't play racquetball, squash, I can't, you know, I can't jump around, I can't do this stuff, but I don't accept that. I was told I had a tumor in my brain when I was 32. It's still there, and I'm fine. I didn't treat it, I'm fine. It gave me massive growth. I was 5'1 in high school. I'm 6'7". I tell people the difference is personal growth. <laughs> I had growth hormone that exploded me up. I still, the tumor didn't grow, so I didn't accept this diagnosis. I didn't say it wasn't there. I just said I won't accept that there's nothing can be done. And the world we're in today, you can find answers. And so I, I pushed, and I know some of the best doctors around the world, and I found a doctor in Australia who said to me, Tony, we can do this. You sent me MRIs of people with similar situations, and the way they solve it is with 100 hours of hyperbaric oxygen, where you go inside a coffin, and they make it so pressured, about 65 pounds below, or 65 feet below the ocean pressure, and they fill you with oxygen, and it releases 800% more stem cells, and it starts to heal. And he says to me, though, before you come all the way to Australia, which is where he is, go do these blood tests so I can see what's happening to your blood, how much inflammation you have, what's going on. And I said, okay, and I went and did it. And when I was there, the guy who was doing the blood said, you want to do a metals test? I said, you mean like mercury? I said, oh, I had my amalgams out 25 years ago. He goes, well, we do lead and we do aluminum. I said, all right, let's do it. And then the doctor calls me two weeks later every single day. And I'm busy. So I said, send me the report. He goes, I must speak to you on message. So I call him up and he said, you should be in the hospital right now. I said, what? He said, you have the highest level of mercury we've ever measured here in the United States. We measure on a zero to five scale. If you're three or above, your body's so toxic, you can die. You can have a heart attack, you can have a stroke. You are 123. He said, the highest I've ever measured is 76. I said, that's impossible, how could that be? He said, we can tell by the type of mercury, it's fish. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so intense in my life that I've made my diet really simple. It's salad, veggies, and fish. And the two fish I always had, and I'm, I'm telling you this, is swordfish, which I loved, and tuna. They are 75-year-old living fish, and they eat all the smaller fish, and they have a 1,000 times more mercury today, but no one tells you this because the fishing industry would be ended if you knew it. So, and two other doctors looked at it, and one of the other doctors said, how long has he been in the hospital? And I just got off stage in a 50-hour seminar, 5 0 over four days. And I was like, no wonder I'm exhausted because it destroys your mitochondria, which creates ATP, which creates energy. I'm thinking, I'm just exhausted because I'm working so hard. And then I was also losing my memory. And then I've always sweat, but sweat like I did when I first ran on stage here. Because if I start running, all of a sudden my body has to work so hard, it just, it's pushing to keep going. I would be dead today if I had not torn my rotator cuffs, if I had not hurt my spine, if I'd not been in a position where I'd hurt my arms so bad I can't sleep on my side and had to put a sleep app on. Life is always happening for us, not to us, even when it doesn't look that way. It's our job to find the benefit. And I'm telling you this now for another reason, which is please go get your metals test because the world we're in today is so toxic that out of 12 of my friends that I told this in the first few weeks, six of them all had poisoning. And they thought they were just exhausted or tired or frustrated. Lots of people get diagnosed with dementia. I find myself on stage, it's happened once or twice here, hopefully you didn't notice, but I can tell you now where I thought, where the hell am I? And I've never had that in my life. I do 50 hours without missing a beat. And it's changing, I don't have a script. I'm looking at you, I'm feeling, I'm responding, but I go like, why am I telling this story? But all that'll come back when it's gone. I'm down to 18 from 123. It's taken me nine months to do it. I'm not there yet, but I'm almost there. Thank you very much. If you're watching somewhere else in the world, you're here, go get a metals test. And if you do and you, you've got this in your body, get it out. There's a man named Dr. Shane. He's one of the best metals guys in the world. You can find him on the web. He's made a giant difference for me. And I'm going to get those things back. But I wouldn't have got them back unless all these horrible things have happened. I just give it to you as a metaphor for what you think is your worst day could be your best day. But it requires some faith. Faith that there's a higher purpose and everything that happens in our lives and making ourselves look for it. So I want to finish by showing you how to end suffering in two minutes. There are many ways. I don't have any more time. I'm out of time. You've been so gracious. I hope this has been touching for you. I hope it's made you think. Who here has decided in your gut suffering ends here tonight? I'm curious. Not all of you are going to do it. Who really is going to do this? Say I. Then I want to ask you to do two things. I want you to ask you to send me a note. And you can send the note to, and what, uh, I'll have my team put it up there. It's an email. They'll throw it up there. I don't know what the name of it is, quite honestly. I would love to hear your commitment and why. And then I'd love to have you copy that to two people you respect, two people you love, 
Because if you do that, they're going to know why you're going to do this, why you want to live this beautiful state every day, why you'll do it no matter what, even if it doesn't. That ends suffering now at TonyRobbins.com. And I would love to hear your story of what you're going to do. That's why I came by here. I'll be inspired by it. But more importantly, you'll be making a commitment. I'm nobody. But if you commit by telling me and a couple other people that matter, you might also inspire them to consider the possibility. I wish I could go deeper on the subject, but what I want to give you is a tool. Because if you make the decision, then you're going to come up with suffering. How do you end it? By the way, when I say 90-second rule, in the beginning, it should have been a four-hour rule. Maybe a few years ago, it should have been a four-week rule. Like, but now, once I've done it over and over again, just like getting in state, it becomes a habit. And now you can do it so easily. And the freedom you'll feel will be amazing. But let's finish by showing you how to do it. And I'll do it with a real experience for you. Stand up. Shake your body out. Before we do anything else, let's crank the energy so we're high level to do this. I want you to face the party and go, I own you! No, I own you! I want you to outdo their energy for 20 seconds, and I want you on a 0 to 10 to go to level 20. So 10 feels like it would be relaxing. Let's clap, and then we'll jump. Ready? One. Two. Before we leave, let me make two announcements, and after this, we'll go. We'll do our end suffering. If you'd like to help someone else end suffering, join me. Spend 10 bucks. Let me double it. Or 100, let me double it. Whatever good you do, I'll double. Up to 5 million. Feeding America, go to feedingamerica.com. You can do it. Or how many found tonight to be profound you'd like to continue this kind of feeling? Say, I. If you want to get something that will support you long term, I have a, a digital product, it's called the Ultimate Edge, probably saw it years ago, it's an updated, it's $300, if you want to get it, it's $200, if you do it now, but I'll do it 100% of the profits to another organization that I'd love to make a difference with, and it's an organization that frees people that are trafficked, it's specifically the young boys and young girls that are in sexual slavery, and the organization is called Underground Railroad, they're extraordinary. I'll give every penny that you invest in yourself, those $200, do to it. It'll take about 18 of you to free one child. What would it be like? I've freed 200 in the last two weeks. I'd love to free another 100 in partnership with you while you change your life. So if you want to do that, you can go to, show them the text where they can go, flip it up there real fast, you can take a picture. That would be a good time. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there it is. So if you text Dreamforce, the ultimate edge, at 44222, um, you'll receive it. If you do it within the next 48 hours, I'll donate to 100% of it. You'll get to the benefit of changing your life. And the last thing is if you'd like to come to a real seminar instead of three hours and an environment where, where everybody is primed for this kind of experience, I'm coming here to San Francisco, coming up here in November 10th through the 12th. And if you also text or go to my organization there, They'll give you $100 off if you want to go. I'm going to feed a million people in San Francisco, by the way, that week here in November. That's going to be my gift out of that event as well. So it's something we can all do together. If you'd like, just reach out and do it. Those are ways you can continue the journey if you want to. I've given you a book. I hope it's helpful for you on the financial side. If you want a second opinion, go to secondopinion.com. That's it. Let me now do the final piece. Shake your body up. Here's what I want you to do. Think of a place where you have suffered. Frustration, overwhelm, anger, sadness, feeling not enough something. And what if there was a quick way to end it? Here's how that can be done in a matter of moments. First, you only suffer because of what you focus on. And you're focusing on one of three things. Three words you want to remember going forward. Loss, less, or never. If you're suffering, it's because your brain believes because you did something to me, or the government did, or the company did, or the other employee did, or I did something, or because you didn't do something, or I didn't do something, I have lost something. Lost love, lost time, lost energy, lost respect, lost significance, lost anything. The illusion of loss makes us suffer. All you've lost was your expectations weren't met. Because there's no guarantee in life. Could we walk across the street and get by a car? Of course we can. That's loss. Everything else is an illusion. It just means your preferences weren't met. The second thing that will make you suffer is if you think something you did 
or didn't do, or something someone else did or didn't do, cause you to have less of something you value, less love, less joy, less time, less energy, less acknowledgement. If you feel like you have less, you will suffer. And the third one and the worst one is, if your brain starts believing that you failed to do something, I failed to do something, or you did something, or I did something, it means I will never have that love, have that joy, have that success, have that acknowledgement, have that freedom. When our brain believes we've lost, or we have less, or we'll never, we suffer. And all those are illusion. The way you get out of it is really simple. You're never gonna go from suffering to joy. It's too big a jump. So you go from suffering to appreciating something. How many of you, no matter how bad your life is, there's something you can appreciate? Your health, your children, your life, the country you live. How many got something you can appreciate? Say I. Is there something you can appreciate in every moment, even in the worst moment you've been in? Yes or no? Yes or no? And if you're so smart, which I know you are, you should be easily find those things. All it is is you decide, I'm not going to suffer, so when I feel it, within 90 seconds, I figure out what it is. I don't live there. I find something to appreciate. I find something next to enjoy. Second step, once you appreciate and enjoy, I want to learn from this. What can I learn? What can I grow? If in the middle of that problem you learn from that relationship, then it's not a bad ending of a relationship anymore. If you grow from it, you're going to feel alive. And thirdly, third step, after I appreciate and enjoy, learn and grow, throw it up. If you do anything loving, if you give anything, if you're grateful, your suffering will end. Are there people that have been concentration camps that were able to end suffering even though there was physical pain? Yes or no? What I learned through all this pain in my body was there's pain and there's suffering. One of the difference, pain is that shock feeling of pressure and tension running up my spine. Suffering is why did this happen to me? Will I ever be able to do this again? Can I ever get back on stage? What am I, we, how long will this, will, this, will this last? The story is the suffering. It's easy to deal with pain. It's the suffering that makes it so hard. Raise your hand if you follow what I'm talking about here. Say I. So I'm going to give you one technique right now. We'll do it really fast so you know it works. Shake your body up. In fact, right now, develop a quick pattern. I want you to make a move that if you made that move, you'd feel strong instantly. Just try something. Make a strong move of some sort. Make a move. Make a move. Make a move. Make a sound when you just shout the word yes when you make your move. Make your move. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Now here's what I want you to do. How many of you have a situation either at home or in your work environment where there's some unfinished business, where there's a situation with a person or a situation that you need to handle, and it's stressful inside when you think about it, so you try not to think about it, you do other stuff. But it's got to be handled, and you've not handled it. How many got an area where there's some suffering like that? Raise your hand nice and high. Let me see. Virtually everybody. Good. Think of that situation that really bugs you, and really think about how it really feels if you really let yourself focus on it and feel what that suffering would be like. And I want you to pick something that on a scale from zero to 10, where 10 is total suffer and zero is no suffering at all, that's in the eight or above range at least, seven, eight, nine, 10. Don't pick a little one because you won't notice in this quick moment enough for you to feel it. I want you to feel a difference. How many got something that needs to be handled, you've not resolved it, you're either pissed off or you feel hurt or you feel worried, or you're concerned, and you've not handled it, and you put it off, and it needs to be handled. Raise your hand if you got, and the pain of it is, a, if you focus on it, is seven, eight, nine, or 10. Let me see your hands. Awesome. Here's what I want to show you. A group of scientists discovered something about 20 years ago that's amazing. If I measure your brain waves and your heart waves, your EEG and your EKG, you've probably seen them on, you know, on medical pieces. They look very jagged when you're stressed. They don't look anything alike. Your brain waves and your heart waves. But if all you do is put both your hands on your heart, try it now, and you physically feel your heart. See the example I'm giving you? So this is frustration. You can see they look nothing like each other. But if you put your hands on your heart and you physically feel your heart, like breathe in your heart just for a moment. We're going to do this for two minutes. That's all. We're going to be done.